One evening about five years ago, I travelled to Loch Ness with a friend to see the loch and the surrounding area. We had planned on arriving by afternoon to spend the evening and then head to the hotel when it got dark. That was perfect. We got there no problems and spent the day talking and taking in the beautiful landscape. The moon began to rise and then we decided it was time to head back as we had spent the majority of it there. As my friend began to drive back, she went around a sharp bend. And I mean the word to it is very meaning. She narrowly avoided a man standing on the edge. She was quite understandably in shock and slammed on her brakes in sheer panic. She began to pant, verging on hyperventilating as I tried to calm her down. She had believed she hit the man when she swerved. The man was okay as we later learnt because he walked towards the car and apologized for standing so near the road. After, we tried to make small talk with repeat apologies. He showed me two pictures and asked if I knew the people, because he was trying to track them down. It was dark, so I switched on the light and quickly glanced, then I said I didn't. I showed my friend and she shook her head without properly looking, but was still in shock. The man didn't ask for the photos back, nor did that conversation go any further. He apologized again and wished us a good night. Without realizing, I joked that we would be better once we got back to the hotel. He laughed and walked off, and we drove on. When we were in the hotel room, I looked at the two pictures more attentively and felt sick to the pit of my stomach. One picture was of me and my friend stood at the water's edge overlooking the lock with my arm wrapped around her. The picture had been taken from behind. The second picture was of me and my friend walking together, our faces clearly seen. That picture was taken from the side, but it must have been done in a wooded area because you could see tree branches. We both sat there for about an hour with the pictures at our fingertips facing us speechless. I tried to remember the man, but couldn't remember any features because of the darkness besides a beard, glasses, and that he was soft spoken. Later that night, I was awoken by my friend who was screaming frantically. When I ran into the room, she said that the man with the tall glasses was watching her through the window. We packed up and left, and I've never been back to Loch Ness since. I was about seven years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mum woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway, a windowed doors we always kept locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard, and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mum had a bad habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper, and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote off as my brother telling ghost stories to try and scare me, or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was terrified of it, for fear of seeing a ghost at the other end of the hallway or through the window is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was 18, my mum and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendencies towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mum blurt out, 
Don't you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise, because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops. Gonona family in a quiet rural neighborhood. I asked her what she was talking about, and she looked equally surprised as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. Well, one night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window, and when I looked, I saw a man standing in my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running, and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up. Tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short, dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. Turns out he'd escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now I know it sounds so obvious hearing these two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago in my mid-twenties that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. This incident happened at my ex-girlfriend's friend's house. We're still good friends. He's a single dad called Scott. And at the time of this incident, Scott's daughter was only shy of four years old. Scott lives in a pretty old house in LA with wood floors and was built in the twenties. It's a modest two bedroom home where it's just him and his daughter. Scott is a complete skeptic when it comes to the paranormal. But even he says his house feels creepy at times. The odd knock here, faint footsteps there, pretty much the usual creepy old house noises in his opinion. He does wake up from them from time to time, hearing his daughter talking to her imaginary friend while also having a deep and intense feeling of dread. He chalks this up to sleep paralysis and his toddler being a toddler. Fast forward to the day of the incident. His daughter was busy playing with her toys in a sort of empty den he has, where she has a few toys in the corner of the room. It's a handy place for her to play while he works from home, so he can still keep an eye out for her. So she's playing away, having her normal conversation with her friend. This time, Scott was curious and asked who she was talking to. She giggled and told him that she was asking for her to go to her house and play with her. Scott asked where she lived. She shrugged and answered, I don't know. Then she hops up and tells her dad that she's right there in the room. She then starts asking for daddy to take pictures of both of them. Now, Scott doesn't really believe his daughter is talking with a ghost. His daughter is at that age where she's fascinated with phones and cameras and any sort of technology, really. He, being the good dad he is, pulls his phone out and begins taking pictures. At first, he snaps one or two and is trying to get his daughter to smile. He then starts taking burst photos and sort of teasing and playing with his daughter and says to her, tell your friend to smile too, trying to make his daughter feel like she isn't strange for having an imaginary friend. Well, when he says this, she gets a very serious face and says, Dad, Lily never smiles. Something about the way she said it sent chills down his spine. What's worse is that later, he's scrolling through the burst pictures he took earlier and was deleting one after another and just generally cleaning up the folder so it wasn't full of the same pictures over and over. So anyway, he's swiping, deleting, swiping, deleting until he gets to this picture. <laughs> this happened to my mum's best friend. She was driving home late one night from work when she got pulled over by a police officer. She had no idea why, but figured it could be a tail light or something. So she pulled over. When the officer approached, he confirmed to her that her taillight was out 
and asked for her license and registration. So she gave it to him, and he disappeared to his car for a while. Later he came back. He started asking her weirder and weirder questions. They started regularly. Where are you going slash coming from? But then they started getting personal. Do you have a husband at home? Any children? Any weapons? A daughter? Any aggressive pets? Once the question started getting concerningly personal, she told him that it was inappropriate to be asking these questions. Then he started getting aggressive. I'm a cop. Do you know what that means? It means you shut up and do what I say. Now step out the car. Obviously, she was pretty scared at this point. She rolled up the window and started looking through her purse for her phone. At this point, the officer went straight up violent. He was pounding on her window and trying her door, yelling crazy stuff like, get out of the car, you dirty, insert curse word here. So in a full blown panic, she stepped on the gas and drove away. A chase occurred for a short while, but the cop quickly stopped following her as she got closer to the main road. She then called 911 where she learned that there were no officers that were supposed to be in that location. It was in the coming days it turned out that there was a rapist who was posing as a cop in the area. She had never had a broken tail light at all, but he had her address, her personal info, and even knew about her husband and daughter. She told him she didn't own weapons, so she immediately purchased a pistol. Unfortunately, she was forced to live in fear for a while until they finally caught the man. This happened at Otacon, the anime convention of the East Coast in the USA. At this point in time, I was around 15 years old, standing at a whopping 5'5", and a girl, slim, but other than that, fairly unattractive and not too noticeable. Me, being the nerd that I am, was really excited to attend my first anime convention. My friend that had told me yes, there was the occasional creeper, but other than that, everything was relatively fine because we're all a bunch of nerds in costumes trying to have fun like it's a three day Halloween party. Sounds like a blast, right? I put together a nicely homemade cosplay and I'm ready to face the world. Aya Shamei Maru from Ohome, for those interested. Now, I'm not a very social person, even around my friends, so they let me wander around the convention alone and go people watching and whatnot. On the second day, some dude comes up and wants a picture. He doesn't have any kind of costume on, but is wearing some anime shirt. I agree and pose, because a bunch of people have been asking for my picture. Then he asks me a bunch of questions, as if I were actually Aya. I knew a lot of people did roleplay as their characters, so I decided to play along and do just that. After the conversation was over, I decided to look back to the wares in the dealer's room. Guess who was there? Fanboy. Well, this guy was a little taller than me, and I could tell he was older, probably at least in his 20s. Dude starts chatting me up and shouts, I love you too, since he was standing right next to the table for it. He just seemed like a really eccentric fan to me, so I thought that he was weird and probably didn't mean any harm. Now he starts talking to me about how much he loves Aya, calling her his waifu, and how I apparently look similar to how he imagines her in his head. This is where I start to get a bit concerned. I excuse myself and leave, but he follows me around and keeps asking me in-character questions. I looked around for a security person, but surprisingly, I didn't really see one outside of the man by the doors coming in, and we were on the other side of the room. So I kept wandering around trying to lose the dude because, I don't know, I didn't actually think to go through with alerting security as it wasn't necessarily an emergency. I wanted to contact one of my friends, but also didn't want to worry them. Like I said, I was 15 and more book smart than street smart. The dude keeps following me around and continues on with his questions. Eventually, I manage to lose him and decide to get some overpriced lunch inside the convention center because I'm not going outside in the summer heat. I sit down at one of the tables and just think to myself, oh no, as I see the guy again in the distance ordering something too. 
Now that was probably the first time I've ever purposefully avoided someone. I picked up my sandwich and left. I don't think he noticed me. And that was my first mistake. The guy catches me in the halls and starts talking about the usual Aya related stuff. I try giving him the cold shoulder, but it doesn't work very well, seeing as he's oblivious and very persistent. Then he starts talking about how cute I am and going on about the whole waifu thing. Now at this point, I was pretty creeped out and asked him to stop. He seemed very confused and acted like he didn't know what he did wrong. And everything goes back to how it was 10 seconds ago. Now at this point, he had followed me into the artist's alley and I was probably visually uncomfortable. I'm practically backing away from this dude and I politely try to tell him to go away. Then I see some guy in a fursuit walk up to us. Now I'm sitting there thinking, oh God, please no. Because I immediately assume it's one of the dude's friends as I notice he'd been watching us for at least a minute. The first thing that comes out of this giant blue dog's mouth is an irritated, hey buddy, I'm gonna need you to back off my friend. Now, I didn't know anyone who owned a fursuit, but I have never in my life been so relieved to see an impossibly colored anthropomorphic dog. Now this dog guy is extremely tall, dwarfing me and being big enough to intimidate fanboy over here. He doesn't wanna leave though, making up some crap excuse about he's just having fun. Then another fursuiter comes up and stands next to the blue dog guy and is also pretty big. There's two more in the background looking over at us. And it's at this point the weeb realizes it's time to leave and reluctantly slinks away looking back every so often. Since the furry crew was looking around at the vendor's wares, like I was, they decided to stick around with me for a bit to help ward off the creeper. And it worked. I never saw the dude again. It can certainly be unnerving to have someone follow you around so persistently. I am a waitress at a local Italian restaurant that also does deliveries and pickups. One day, I would say a year ago, a man came into my place to carry an order. A girl I work with noticed him walking up to the door and asked me if I could take care of him. I said yes, not really thinking anything of it, and she walked back into the kitchen. He came in, and I could see why she had asked me to serve him. He immediately gave me the creeps. He was an older man, short and stout, wearing a big coat and a winter hat. He reeked like someone who had smoked an entire pack of cigarettes while walking through piles of cow poo. Thinking of it now in my apartment all alone, I can still smell him. What really scared me was the way he stared into my face. Chin turned down towards his chest, looking up at me through his eyebrows. The stare made me feel like he was thinking of every possible way to torture me. He didn't say much, just sort of growled his order of me. He paid and waited behind the counter for his pizza to take home. He would pace with his hands locked behind his back while never shaking that stare. Even when he would turn to pace the other way, he never shook his glance away from me even for a second. Being that I'm working behind this counter, I can't really go anywhere in case someone calls or comes to get their order. So I just stood there, waiting for the clock for his order to be done so he could leave. Once he was gone, I asked my co-worker if she knew anything about him and why she wanted me to take care of him. She told me that he gives her the creeps and that he was a registered offender but never went into the details of his charges. And honestly, I didn't even want to know. I still thought about him for the rest of the day and looked twice before getting into my car at the end of the night. But sure enough, I soon forgot about him. Unfortunately, it didn't last. He began to go in very frequently. At first, maybe once every other week, then every week, then every day. Every time he would order the same thing and began his pacing with that burning stare. Every chance I would run to the kitchen or get away from the counter, I would. My coworker would make jokes about how much he liked me, saying he has never stared that hard at any other worker in that way before. These jokes didn't make me feel better to say the least. The jokes halted when we noticed his pattern. We noticed that he only comes in when I would be working. 
we started to suspect that he recognized my car. I never had the same schedule, but I always parked in the same spot in our very open parking lot, so you'd always be able to tell who was there if you knew their cars. The shifts that I would work were a little strange as well. There was a very, very dead time at the day where we would cut half the staff, giving us a break for a few hours long. He began to come in sometimes twice a day I was working. He would come in while I would work in my morning shift and then come again from my evening shift. Or maybe it was just a crazy coincidence. Nevertheless, it freaked me the hell out. One night after working a double shift on a Saturday, I had walked out to my old car, which I never locked. Three out of the four doors on my car were broken in some way, so it's easiest to just keep them unlocked at all times. And I could admit that car was a piece of crap. No one would have dared steal it. So I never worried about it. Until this particular night, I got into my car and immediately noticed the stench. My car reeked exactly like the man. That same smell of non-menthol cigarettes and cow poo was around me. I had completely convinced the man had been in my car that day. Since then, I had someone escort me to my car every night. And I haven't seen that man in the last year. I hope you take your business elsewhere, creep. Let's never meet again. This story takes place 10 years ago. I was 14 at the time. I grew up in an old farmhouse, far out on a rural road. Cornfields surrounded our home and our closest neighbors were two to three miles away. The nearest town was a 15 minute drive. One thing that was really nice about living out there was that you didn't get a lot of strangers knocking at your door to either sell or talk religion with you, but we did get a few. One night it was just my mother and I home making baked goods for a fundraiser for my little brother's Boy Scout troop. Dad and brother were out helping my uncle with some cows, if I remember rightly. We were bustling around the kitchen, talking and laughing. Mum and I have always been close. Soon we heard a knock at the door, just an average, normal knock. A tap, tap, tap. Mum, hmm, to herself, and took off her dishing gloves to open the door. I stood at the kitchen island, rolling out some dough for a few pies, but also watching my mother go to the door. I had a slight twinge of anxiety in my stomach, but chalked it up as being one of my normal flurries. As my mum walked towards the door, the person on the other side gave another tap, this time in a rhythm. My mum stopped. She turned and began walking back to the kitchen with a pale look on her face. She went to our kitchen window that seemed to face out towards the porch. She went to the side where you'd be able to see the porch clearly. Mum pulled back the curtain enough to peek and not be noticed from the outside. The look on her face deepened. She went to the other side of the window then to look out to the driveway. I had stopped what I was doing at this point, deciding that pie crusts probably weren't that important in this moment as the feeling in my stomach was in a full-blown flurry. Mum's eyes widened as she looked out. She then closed the curtain and looked at the floor. The look on her face was angry, but also scared. She walked over and grabbed my wrist and walked us to the closet as she quietly asked me if I had my cell phone. I did. She pulled out my dad's prized Louisville slugger from the closet. The person at the door started banging at the door hard. I gasped a bit. Mum looked at me and shushed me, then took my arm again and walked me towards my parents' bedroom, locking the door and windows as we went. At one point, she stopped at the window in our living room and peeked out. She closed it quickly and let out a frustrated noise. We got to the bedroom and she pulled me in and locked the door. She took my phone and began dialing as she gave me the bat. She sat me down on the floor on the side where I'd be hidden from the door and opened the closet to get the gun case. She talked quietly on the phone and I was terrified and couldn't focus on what she was saying. She pulled out my dad's shotgun and quickly loaded it. I looked at her scared as she hung up. She pulls me up again and walked me out the bedroom. We creeped back over to the other side of the house where the bathroom was. Mum gave me my phone and ushered me inside. 
She set down the gun and looked at me with both hands on her shoulders. You need to listen to me. There are some men outside and they're walking around the side of the house. I looked at her with wide eyes. I could feel myself shaking. Why, what do they want? I don't know, but you need to stay in here, lock the door, and don't come out until I tell you, understand me? I nodded and she squeezed my shoulders. I'm gonna barricade the door from the other side. I will not move the barricade until I let you know that it's me. I knew what she was saying immediately. Crawl out the bathroom window and run if it's moved otherwise. My mum shut the door and I quickly locked it. I heard her move the quartz chest in front of the door, a very heavy box with lots of quartz from over the years. I sat on the floor in front of the window clutching the baseball bat. I sat there for what seemed like hours, but was merely five minutes. While I sat there, I heard two footsteps outside the window, two deep voices talking quietly. You sure they're in there? Maybe no one's home. Nah, there's at least two women in there. Heard them talking at the door. Saw a guy and a kid leave when we passed the house earlier. I shivered and started to hyperventilate, but quickly covered my mouth with a towel to mute it. Who were they? What did they want? Why were they here? Soon I heard another voice. Guys, let's go. Charlie spoiled cops down the road. Then I heard three sets of feet running towards the front of the house. I was crying at this point, tears pouring down my face. Was it over? Were they leaving? A few more minutes go by and I hear a man's voice in the house. I started to panic and huddled into the corner of the bathroom, and I heard my mum's voice on the other side of the bathroom door. It's me. The sheriff's here. They're gone. I'm moving the trunk. I got up and unlocked the door and opened it to find the sheriff and my mum moving the trunk out the way. I quickly ran to my mum's arms and we stood there holding each other. The sheriff said he had quite a few more officers chasing down the van and that he needed to ask me and my mum some questions. My mum nodded and we walked to the kitchen where there was the smell of burnt cookies in the air. The sheriff asked us questions and that's when I found out what my mum saw. When she looked out and saw the man who was knocking at our door, she knew something was off immediately. He was casually dressed, gym shorts and a wife beater, not something a salesman or person of a church would wear when coming around. So then my mum thought that maybe his car broke down or something and that he was looking for help. So she looked out at the driveway and saw something that made her stomach drop. There was a van in our drive, parked in a way that wouldn't allow my mother's car to leave with a man in the passenger seat and another leaning in towards the front of the van, talking to the passenger. But mum noticed that even though both were still, the van was still slightly rocking, like there were more people inside. As my mum and I were finishing up with the sheriff, a deputy walked in and he looked pale. He looked at my mum, the sheriff and me, and the deputy went. Sir, we were able to catch up with the van. They lost control and swerved into the ditch actually. Any of them hurt? No, they're fine, but uh, we, we have them in custody. The sheriff quirked an eyebrow. There were five men in the van. We asked them what they were doing out here and what they walked around the house like they did for. And what did they say? They said they were vacuum salesmen, sir. That they were a team out trying to sell their product they made. The sheriff scoffed for a bit. Well, Jones ended up checking the van and... Well... Well what? Do we have a drug bust or something? The deputy gulped and looked at my mum and me again. N no sir, not what we found at all. They took my mum outside and told her what they found. She was horrified and came back sobbing and holding me. After that they phoned my dad and he came rushing home. My other uncle, a mountain of a man, stayed that night just in case. Dad and mum spent no expense on home security and taught both of us kids how to shoot and load a gun. My aunt and uncle gave us one of their German Shepherd puppies as well. Mum had to train him to be an attack dog, but you wouldn't be able to tell. When not in defense, he was a dopey, lovable pup. This still wasn't enough to settle mum though, and brother and I ended up going to self-defense lessons too. My cousins were sent with us. 
It wasn't until a few years later that I found out what was in the van. Coincidentally, we were making cookies and other homemade candy for a Christmas party. I finally asked my mum about it. And she was shocked that I asked, but knew I'd find out eventually. So what was in the van? They found rope, tape, burlap saps, and even sedatives, as well as a gun. Several of them. And what the police described as burner phones. When they had taken all the guys back, and after hours of questioning, one of them broke, and said they were having no luck in nabbing anyone in town, so they went out to rural areas. The closest town is a very tightly knit community where everyone watches each other's back. This terrified me. I would have never have guessed it. To this day, I'm very careful about whom I open the door for, and I can't sleep unless I have some sort of weapon in the bedside table. It's really shattered my trust in others. I go out and automatically assume most people are going to hurt me. My therapist is trying to help me with this. I sincerely hope that I never have to go through another situation like this again. I used to work quite late at the University of South Florida, as I like to do my work when no one else is around. My apartment is just a short ways off, roughly a 10 minute drive or 40 minute walk away, depending on what I took. So while I do live in Tampa and it's far and away from the cities, no three story buildings in sight, a few neighborhoods, ample amounts of trees and ponds, and a stone's throw away from a rather sizable state park of 240 acres, which in turn is adjacent to a substantially larger wilderness area. What that means, is a lot of wildlife. I regularly see deer grazing on the golf course nearby, growling alligators roaming the ponds, and small lakes turtles abound. Plenty of vultures, storks, and smaller birds and much more on my nightly walks or drives. I've often seen and heard foxes, bobcats, coyotes, and even a black bear once. So as you can imagine, when I found out several cats and a small dog had gone missing, I naturally thought that if a predator was responsible, it would be one of the larger coyotes, bobcats, or maybe even a bear or gator. People, especially in gated communities, leave their pets out to roam about the day or night. Still, that did leave the question of how a predator could or would get over several fences and gates, some of which would be quite a hassle to climb, and there was no signs of being tunneled under. So why go for a pet inside a box that would be harder to get out of when fat ducks were extremely abundant? Well, I got my answer in one way I never expected. I was driving back from the lab late at around 11 p.m. when I stopped as I could see an animal on the road. The figure was very tall, but also very thin. So I initially thought the pale color to be from a deer from the rear. However, I soon noticed the animal was actually pale all over its main body. It had extremely thin, dark legs, and when it raised itself up, I noticed I was looking at a great white heron from behind. Great white herons are a regional color morph of great blue herons being nearly all white in coloration, including the trademark tassels coming off the brows of the birds save for the top jaw and feet, which are both dark blue or black. The white form usually only appears in very southern Florida, but occasionally one will show up further north. They also tend to be on the larger end of the species size. I make no jest when I note how big this avian was. Standing up straight, the biggest great herons can look a grown man in the eye behind nearly a foot long rapier shaped beak. The heron was throwing its head up and down and clearly doing something, but I wasn't sure what. I was standing in the road about 20 yards ahead of the car and could only react when I got closer. It swung its head around and I'll never forget the sight as I stopped 10 yards away. The heron was standing still unflinching as its eyes brightly reflected in the headlights. The white feathers across the chest and part of the wing were stained in a tarry red from coagulated blood, as it had half of a cat hanging out of its mouth.
Herons can gulp down surprisingly large prey, such as big fish, muskrats, bullfrogs and even young alligators. But it's one thing to see them swallow a wild creature whole in still frame or in pixel on a video. It's a whole different ordeal to see one doing it in the flesh after having killed its prey by impaling it on its beak. When I compared the beak to a rapier earlier, I meant it. They can impale that thing through the armored scales of a garfish. Herons have been known to kill eagles by ramming their beaks through the latter's chest. Poor cat, never stood a chance. The heron didn't seem at all phased by my arrival. Instead, it flicked the dead cat back and forth into position in its mouth before tilting its head up. You know that shot from Jurassic Park when the Tyrannosaurus swallows a goat? Same sort of visual at first, only with another disgusting detail. When the heron started swallowing, its thin neck bulged outwards to accommodate the food. It kept its eyes pointed straight at me as the big wad of slain feline slowly worked down its throat to the crop, sometimes a limb visibly impressing towards the outstretched skin. All the while, the heron let out raspberry breaths while standing tall, still spattered in gore from pecking on the poor pet to death. And after it finally swallowed its prey, the heron paced closer to the side of the road. It actually got next to the car at one point and was close enough I could confirm its height to be about five feet or more, because the top of its back was level with my side mirror. It was at that point I realized I had the windows partially rolled down and was smelling sanguine musk of death. The damn bird was nearly level with my window looking right at me and leaning closer. Needless to say, that snapped me out of my stupor. I blared the horn to make it back off. On the menu or not, I didn't like how it was looking at me. Driving down the road and making the turn, I could still see it looking towards the car as it paced down the darkened sidewalks like it was the most casual thing ever. A four to five foot tall predator half covered in blood just to be there. Obviously, I was in no direct danger myself being in the car and decidedly not on the menu, but I didn't like the way it looked at me. This avian predator clearly didn't at all fear people, even if it seemed conscious of cars and my presence. And given this happened in a gated community, I'd never seen any mammalian predators bigger than a possum in. I think I now know what was eating those pets. We often can hear nowadays that birds are living dinosaurs, but I don't think some quite register that the featherheads they're familiar with are fat city pigeons or delicious fowl. I think seeing this would help get the message across. And at night, every so often, I can still hear the deep throaty shrieks that species gives off from flying over the forests and swamps and into the neighborhoods. Don't leave your pets out, people. I am a regular congoer and cosplayer. So when I was offered a free badge to a small late summer comic book convention when I was 17, I thought, why not? I really didn't have any cosplays planned out since it was last minute, but I did have everything I needed to make a convincing Daisy Buchanan from The Great Gatsby. All day went great. I volunteered at the booth of the people who had invited me handed out swag and came across a lot of nice people who liked and recognized my Daisy Ensemble. At the end of the day, I helped pack up and bid my friends farewell as they left the exhibit hall. I wandered back out the main hall, called my dad and proceeded to wait on him to come pick me up. I knew it would be a while, so I stood by a pillar playing on my phone to kill time. After a while, a man probably in his early to mid thirties came up to me and asked whom I was. I told him I was Daisy Buchanan. He smiled and asked if I could have a photo. I obliged, smiled and posed for the picture as usual. But after this, things got weird. After he had taken the photo of me, he proceeded to stand really close to me, putting his arm up against the pillar I had against my back and began to talk to me. So what do you think of me? 
he asked. I don't know, I just met you, I replied, kind of feeling uncomfortable at this point. Do you want to go to a party after this? The guy from Nine Inch Nails will be there, he then proceeded to say. I just kind of laughed because I knew who Trent Reznor was and didn't need him labelled as the guy from Nine Inch Nails. However, I was also not stupid and realised there would be no such party and no such vague Trent Reznor. When I laughed meekly, though I suppose he took it as a sign of me enjoying his company. You're not going to fall in love with me, are you? He asked. Then I was completely floored. Who does this guy think he is? I was so uncomfortable by that, that I felt my whole body heating up and screamed at me that this guy was a complete and total creeper. I wanted to dart away, but my purse was on the ground and I really couldn't retrieve it without awkwardly crouching down near his legs and then darting off. Uh, no, was all I could reply with. Well, I might fall in love with you. He was about to talk some more, but thankfully, a friend of his, I guess, who had seen the scene unfold, finally interjected. He approached us both and engaged him in some trivial conversation. He was clearly irritated his friend had just blocked him while he was distracted, and I picked up my things and dashed off. I went back to the exhibit hall, but my friends were gone. Unsure of where to sit safely for my dad, I went out front. Luckily, I came across another old friend of mine outside and sat with her until he arrived. When I told my dad what happened, the only thing he said was, I can make it so you can meet Trent Reznor if you want. Thank you, Dad, for your expert counselling. I did get the guy's business card, and when I went to his website, he seemed to be a legitimate photographer who shot models and whatnot. It made me wonder how he was able to keep clients with such a gross demeanour, though. This is my story about my haunted doll, Claire. She's been featured in books, haunted objects, stories of ghosts on your shelves, a few paranormal podcasts, and the TV show Haunted Towns that aired on Destination America back in 2017. You can still catch reruns of the show on the Travel Channel every now and then. She was in the season finale featuring Madonna, Georgia. Here's my story. As an eight-year-old child, I was given an old porcelain doll by a very dear family friend, Miss Marion. She was constantly coming across things and giving them to me. This doll was the last thing she ever gave to me. I was never really into dolls at all growing up, but I took the doll and placed her in my room in a small child-sized rocking chair. The chair sat next to my closet and dresser, right beside my nightstand. The doll was very pretty. She was dressed in a peach and cream coloured dress with an apron and petticoats. She had little black Mary Jane shoes that when removed showed her delicately painted toenails. Her body was soft, only her head Forearms, hands and legs from the knees down were porcelain. Her lips were pink and her dark brown hair hung in slightly frizzed and now loose curls. Her eyes were brown, her cheeks were rosy peach colour, all like mine. Miss Marion made a point of saying the doll reminded her of me, which is why she gave it to me. From the moment the doll, who I named Claire, came into my house, things began to happen. I was always uneasy with Claire. I never wanted to touch her, and when I played in my room, I felt like she was watching me. It wasn't anything to panic about, but I do remember feeling like if I did something wrong, she might actually tell on me. How ridiculous does that sound? The first real occurrence I remember was when I was reading in my room. Ghost stories, if you can believe that. When a musical carousel horse that sat on my dresser began to play. Not just a few notes, which old mechanical music boxes will do at times, but like someone had wound it up fully. I sat stunned, 
and stared at the little horse as it moved up and down in time with the music. Then it just stopped. Not wound down, just suddenly stopped. I was a pretty brave kid. I didn't run, and I didn't tell my parents. I also used to see a shadow man in the hallway, or in my parents' bedroom door, whilst I was growing up. And if my mom didn't believe me about that, she wouldn't believe about the mundane thing like a music box playing. So I just let it go. The next thing that happened was the voice. For several nights, and on into the years, I was woken up by what sounded like a woman inches from my face, shouting my name. Jill, wake up. I jump and sit up and find my room empty. Those happenings died down after a few months. She then started to plague my little brother with the same thing. And now he and I are grown and gone. And she's moved on to my dad. The little things started to get to me. I'd put something in a certain place, only to find it later on the floor or on my dresser right next to Claire. All my missing items eventually turned up around her. Once a ring ended up in the pocket of her apron, books would fall off my shelf and perfume smells would sometimes fill my room. The doll itself didn't smell at all, but the air around her would. My catalyst to finally getting Claire out of my room was the night I woke up after hearing thumping around my closet. I opened my eyes, sat up in bed, and of course my eyes were drawn to the nightlight where Claire sat. As I watched, the source of the thumping became clear. The rocking chair Claire occupied was rocking on its own. I had thick shag carpet, so there was no way it was rocking just by chance. If that wasn't enough, Claire's feet, which were both turned to the side facing the opposite way from each other, slowly straightened themselves to both be pointing directly up. This part still freaks me out 20 years later. She then turned her head, which was quite impossible to do since it was attached, fixed to her cloth body. She looked towards me, and every music box in my room, four of them, started to play all at once. I was frozen in fear. I didn't feel endangered, so as much as I just felt scared of what was happening, I screamed for my mum and dad. The music stopped, but Claire maintained her gaze in my direction. And this is why I hate dolls. Even after that, I couldn't totally get rid of Claire. I ended up stuffing her into the back of a box of a storage closet. She's still there as far as I know. So is the woman who now screams my dad's name in the middle of the night, and not in a good way. While I think she explains some of the oddities that happened in my parents' house, I don't think she is the tie to all, especially the Shadow Man. My friend Tim Weisberg is a paranormal slash radio podcast host of the show Spooky South Coast, and also an author. He asked me to lend him Claire once he heard my story back in 2011. I obliged, and Claire went to stay with him for a few months. He wrote about his experiences with Claire while she stayed with him in the book Haunted Objects that I mentioned earlier. Temperature changes in the rooms she stayed in, along with hearing voices, were two of his notes. Claire also stayed briefly at the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast in 2012. The guys from the Haunted Towns show encountered some things in my parents' house while Claire was with them. She now lives at my friend's old haunted house. He's a Hogan, and he and his lower, along with the other house spirits, tend to keep her in line. My boyfriend at the time was driving me home in the dark. I lived in a really rural area, tons of farms and open fields with winding roads. You didn't pass other cars very often, especially this late at night. As we were driving, we saw this lady in white far ahead of us on a straight stretch of road. I know we both saw it, 
because my boyfriend commented how weird it was she was out so late. I told him that some people just go walking at night, which was true, and she probably lived around there since it was so rural. Night walkers weren't an uncommon thing since the only thing you had to worry about was the wildlife. We got closer and I saw the woman was facing us. Her hair was pretty light colored too, so it was hard to really make her out in the headlights because she was so pale and the lights just reflected off her. She wasn't moving, just facing us as we drove by. And then right as we were about to pass her, she stepped in front of the car. My boyfriend slammed on the brakes. I flew hard, nearly hitting my head on the dash and for about five seconds, we were both silent from shock. I was pretty sure we had just hit someone and being only 15 at the time, that was a hard thing to wrap my head around, but I still got out the car to check on the woman. You can probably guess the next thing that happened. We get out the car and find a huge dent on the hood of the car, but no sign of the woman. In fact, there wasn't any sign of anything at all. There was no blood and we couldn't hear anything around us besides crickets. Everything was just as solemn as it normally was around the area. We looked around for the woman in a nearby bush and everything, but never found a thing. Like I said, there weren't any houses near enough for her to have run to. There weren't any places she could have really hidden and it was like she was never there except for the huge dent in my boyfriend's car. We drove in silence the rest of the way home. I'm not really a big ghost or paranormal person, but this really hit me hard. I told my mum what happened and she asked all of our neighbors if they knew something, but most of them were elderly retirees and didn't know any younger women moving in the area. A few creepy details could be that around the next corner was the old cemetery where some early settlers were laid to rest. And some girl had died a few years back from being hit by a car when the driver fell asleep, not too far from that area. But you can do without what you will. It's such a classic horror tale, no one believes me. But I know it happened because Jesus Christ, that dent cost my boyfriend a pretty penny to fix. And he was not a happy camper for the rest of the week. This happened about five years ago, after my fiance and I had been living in our house for a little over a year. I'm six foot tall and about 225 pounds. I have always been naturally muscular and I'm told I have an intimidating demeanor. My fiance is five foot two, weighs maybe 130 and is a little tiny thing. Our house is a bi-level home where you walk in the front door and there are two half staircases going up the living room or down the basement. The only access to our backyard is through the sliding glass door in the upstairs living room and down the stairs from our deck. During this time, I partied a lot, way more than I should have. I was between jobs and it was towards the end of the holidays. So my interest in finding a new job wasn't quite what it should have been. Many of these nights I was out partying. I would end up just crashing with friends, which meant my fiance spent many nights alone with our three dogs. I had a serious problem with substance abuse, primarily alcohol, and I'm sad to say I was letting it get the better of me. Fast forward a few months, I had just found a new job that had random drug and alcohol test, a godsend in hindsight and I had been sober for all of two days and had begun repairing my relationship with my fiance. When she told me how glad she was, I was sleeping at home again. I thought nothing of it and kissed her on the head and told her I was too and that I loved her. Later that night, my fiance and I were watching TV downstairs when I thought I heard something moving in our backyard. The dogs heard it too, but I dismissed it because they just perked up their ears, but didn't seem too alarmed. A moment later, I hear the noise again and my fiance very quickly mutes the TV and gives me a very nervous look. Did you hear that? She asked, looking very uncomfortable. I told her it's probably just a few of the neighborhood cats playing in our bushes, as there are quite a few outdoor cats living in the area. But she shook her head and began insisting that these weren't the case. 
Before I could even ask her what made her so sure, I hear our sliding glass door upstairs fly open. All three of my Great Danes and myself are on our feet in an instant. The dogs let out the most ferocious sounding barks I've ever heard and tore ass up the stairs with me right behind them. As I'm rounding the first set of stairs and the dogs are reaching the top of the second set, I see the sliding glass door slam closed and the silhouette of a man running away. I get to the door and fling it open, and the dogs shove me out of the way to chase after the would-be intruder. I grab my flashlight, one of those big 4D cell mag lights that cops carry, and run out into the yard. I had just made it down the deck stairs when I see the dogs are freaking out at the back fence. I sprint over and jump the fence, just in time to see the man reach the opposite fence and try to get over it. He was covered head to toe in black clothing, a thin black hoodie, with the hood pulled tight to conceal his face and jet black cargo pants. Without any regard for my personal safety, I charged at the man and barely missed getting a hold of him as he made his way over the fence. Once more I followed him and come around the front of my neighbor's house just in time to see him hop into an old beat up pickup and speed off. I watch for a moment as he tears out of the neighborhood and disappears into the night. I run back home as fast as I can and check on my fiance and make sure she's okay. When I walked into the house, she was sitting in the upstairs living room surrounded by all three of our Great Danes and clutching the biggest knife we own. She was visibly shaken, but ultimately she is a very strong woman and told me she was ready in case I got into trouble. After calling the cops, giving statements and triple checking to make sure every door and window in the house was locked up tight, we decided to watch another movie as neither of us were tired after the adrenaline rush we'd been through. During the movie, I asked her what made us so sure before that it wasn't just cats playing in the yard. What she told me was enough for me to decide it was time to change my whole life. She said for about a month now, she'd been hearing strange noises coming from all around the house late at night. She would hear footsteps outside and occasionally what sounded like whispering. When I asked her why she never told anyone, she just shook her head and said she didn't know. After hearing this, I came to the realization that whoever the man was, he knew that I was never home at night and that my fiance essentially was all alone most of the time. Fortunately for us, he somehow missed the fact that we have three Great Danes and for whatever reason on this night, he decided not to check and make sure she was alone again. Since that day, I have been 100% sober from everything, five years total as of March 1st and have not left my fiance alone overnight since. Our relationship has never been stronger and our three Great Danes are three of the best dogs anyone could ask for. In the end, this experience has changed my life completely, for the better. But creepy wannabe burglar, whatever you are, let's not meet. I have a ghost in my room that loves to throw things at me. But probably the scariest thing that ever happened revolved around one of my porcelain dolls, Caroline. Even my cat avoids her at all costs. The first major thing about Caroline, my haunted porcelain doll, is pretty spooky. It seems like whenever I touch her, any part of her, I get sick or hurt within the next week. That's why I put a little sign by her feet that says do not touch in red capital letters. I think the scariest thing that's happened revolving around her was I saw her move one of her eyes. I don't remember all of everything, but I remember I was sitting on the floor doing homework and I got up to use the bathroom. Right as I did, I saw her left eye blink then changed direction to look directly at me. Needless to say, I hightailed it out of that room. A few weeks ago, I had a weird experience. I bought myself my first car lately, and I'm fairly new to driving, but I needed to get to and from my new place of work. 
I usually work in the afternoon, and on this day I took a little nap right before I had to leave for work. I was half asleep when suddenly a weird voice told me, Don't take the highway today. It was so clear, it startled me and awoke me. I got ready for work and stepped into the car. Despite having this weird feeling, I took the highway. While driving on the highway, I was almost hit by a truck that didn't let me through. My car made this scary loud beeping noise I've never heard before and then suddenly the accelerator stopped working. I had to stop on the side of the highway. I was so scared and I remember the voice immediately, cursing myself that I didn't listen to it. I honestly believe whatever that was tried to warn me and save me, because this could have turned out a lot worse. When I was young, I used to see things I couldn't explain. One of the most notable times was when I was a kid, sleeping on the top bunk in a room with my brother. I woke up in the middle of the night, not really knowing why. When I looked over the shoulder of the bunk bed, I saw what looked like a chariot floating in the air going from left to right. The chariot was small, probably about the height of my hand, and it moved in a snake-like way slithering up and down, like a sound wave or something. In the chariot sat a man and a woman dressed in old-style Victorian clothing. The chariot was being drawn by a long row of horses side by side. It is worthwhile to note that the entire chariot was made up of what looked like fluorescent light, in different shades of white, teal, green and red. Once the first pair of horses hit a certain spot in the room, they disappeared, and each pair of horses, and finally the chariot did the same, almost like they were going through an invisible portal. I would tell my parents about the thing that I saw, and it led to a few years of counselling. Knowing what I do now about the paranormal, I know that I wasn't in need of counselling at all, as I have no schizophrenic background or anything else that would explain what I did. Skip forward to the tender age of 16. I had just recently gotten my driver's license at this time, and I went to hang out with my friends in the neighbouring town. As night came, I decided I'd better get home because I still wasn't too fond of driving at night. Regardless, the sun was completely down, and darkness had come by the time I'd left. The roads that take me from my friend's town back to mine are very rural, with either cornfields or forest on either side no street lights, and hardly any traffic. I turned onto the last rural road leading up to my neighbourhood, and started going up the steep hill onto the streets. As I reached the top of the hill, and made my way over, I saw something strange. On the right side of the road, walking away from me with her back turned, was an old lady walking a small white dog. The lady was wearing a nightgown, white, and white high socks or tights, and had old grey slash white hair. Literally everything about this lady and her dog was pure white. I almost swerved out the way in shock because this is not a road you ever see anyone walking down. It's a 55 mile an hour road with no shoulder in the middle of the countryside. After I passed her, I looked in my rear view mirror, and she had vanished. I want to point out the area I am in is inhabited mostly by wealthy families that keep to themselves, so the chance of it being some sort of crackhead or whatever are about one in a million. After I got home, I went to use the bathroom. I remember clearly thinking to myself, did I just see a ghost? And as I was thinking that, a bottle of shampoo fell from the top shelf of a cabinet in my bathroom. This could have been a coincidence, but never in my 10 years of living here has anything fallen off that shelf. There's a very famous ghost story around my area, Chicagoland, of a lady called Resurrection Mary. She was hit and killed by a car in a town about an hour from my house. Since the 1930s, she's been reported seen walking down the side of the road, hitchhiking in a white gown with blonde hair. I'd not heard of this story until recently, and it got me thinking about my experience. The description of Resurrection Mary is pretty damn close to what I saw. I don't think what I saw was her necessarily, especially considering the distance between her reported location and my sighting. 
the similarities certainly shocked me. My mum once stopped to help an overturned car on the side of a highway. We got out and called the police. I saw the man choking the girl he was with, went to tell my mum, and she waved me off. The guy came up, tried to get her off the phone and ask me if I could help. I sized him up, he was about three times my size, and I'm a scrawny little teenager, so I realised the only way we're going to get out of this is by playing cool and running. My mum would not let me talk to her, and if I tried to raise it to being serious or yelling or anything to get her attention, it would have gotten his too, as he was clearly intoxicated. He asked if I could help move the car. I had assumed it was because telling her to get off the phone wasn't working, so he was trying to bait me over to the car to hurt me. Or he was so drunk that he actually thought we would move an upside down car up a bank. I told him that was a 10 man job and his wife screamed at him saying she got him punching her and crashing the car on camera and that she sent it to his sister. He grabbed my hat, ripped it off with some hair, then grabbed my throat and threw me. I had grabbed my knife before we left, for almost no reason other than, I feel like something might happen. It's always advised to not escalate, but you know, when this guy punched my mom and threw her down the bank after taking the phone, I didn't care. What should or shouldn't I do? I was ready to kill for real. For the only time in my life so far, going through how to level the playing field with this guy and a tiny knife. I told him what I had, and that I would cut him if he touched my mother again, and he focused on me. I jogged back and he came to me, and every time he looked back, I would reiterate what I'd do. My mother told me to run, and I told her to get to the car, and she did. Then I let him get distracted, and I ran around him. Almost got hit by a car that was speeding on the interstate, then made it to the car. Waited for her to start it before I got in and drove to the police station. He was apprehended a few hours later, two felony charges, one for choking his wife, and the second one assaulting an officer. We call the police when we see people in crashes now. I still have nightmares of what could have happened if I decided to use it or if he had gotten to me. I still put my keys in between my fists whenever I'm walking at night and someone's nearby. I've never had to imagine what it would be like to cut someone or see them bleed. My mother still breathes faster every time we drive by that spot. This has been a PSA. I live in an old Victorian house in the UK. It's me, my mom, my dad and my sister. Now my dad and sister aren't very much a fan of yard sales, but we certainly are. Here in the UK they're called boot fairs or car boot sales, depending on where you live. Maybe elsewhere they're called something else. Point being, it's a big yard sale, but you do it in a field and not your yard. Now that that's out the way. My mum is a collector of antiques, all kinds of random stuff, which my dad begrudgingly lets her have and put around the house. What she doesn't put in the house gets left in the garage. Now, on one occasion, we were at a garage sale, and she eyes a porcelain doll. In my mind, it was a hideous thing. But my mother saw it, and said that it reminded her of one that she owned as a child, and would very much like to purchase it. I think she got it for something like 10p, or 9 cents in America. So that was ridiculously cheap. The woman seemed very happy to get rid of it, and my mother was very happy to have obtained it. She packed it in the car, and we got home. We didn't even take it out until the next day. We put it in the garage, because my mother wasn't exactly sure what to do with it, and there it stayed. One thing to mention is that our garage is very secure. It only has one entrance through a side door behind our house, which no one else can access, as our property is very secure. Not only that, we are also very meticulous about organisation. The garage is extremely well organised. Everything has its proper place. So, 
Two weeks later, when my mum thinks that she might move some stuff around in the house and put up some new antiques, does she remember the doll and think that she might do some work doing up its hair or maybe painting it to make it look nicer before she displays it in our home. She goes into the garage and that's when she shouts. I hear her screaming, screaming for my sister and me to come down straight away as my father was at work. We go down and the garage has been absolutely destroyed. Everything is on the floor there are antiques that have been shattered, vases, paintings that were hanging up that are now on the ground. Some of them look like they've been stepped through. It was absolute carnage. I wish I'd have taken a picture. Anyway, the only thing that seemed to remain untouched was a locked chest of drawers in one of the corners and the doll sitting on top of it. My mum, cleaning up bits of pottery, looks up and sees this doll, now in a more ominous light, and says that she was sure she didn't leave it there. Remember how organised my family are, so if she says she didn't leave it there, she really didn't leave it there. She was a bit freaked out, asked if any of us had something to do with this, to which we of course both denied. Not to mention the fact that she was the sole bearer of the key between her and dad as they kept it locked away in their room in the safe. They also had valuables in the locked chest of drawers, you see, and that's why we had to keep it locked away. Anyway, my mum still takes the doll and fixes her up. She looks a lot better after a bit of polish. My mum repaints her lips, does her eyes, and she really is looking top-notch. One of her sleeves of her top was actually a bit worn. She finds a very similar thread and fixes it up too. I was very impressed with my mother's work and she replaced this old Chinese bell with that doll. It went in our living room, which holds another number of antiques. That night, during the middle of the night, we are all suddenly awoken by a loud crash downstairs. We go down and one of my mother's antique vases that was on the chimney is now shattered on the brickwork below. She was nearly in tears, but knows that it wasn't any of us because we were all coming downstairs at the same time seeing what was going on as a reaction to the noise. My dad does a thorough sweep of the house to find nothing. All the windows are closed, all the doors are locked, and there's no way anyone could have gotten away so fast without leaving a trace. The only odd thing, however, is the doll is no longer perched. It is now on the floor. Things start to add up. My dad says he doesn't like the doll and thinks we should get rid of it. My mother, being a no-nonsense kind of woman, absolutely slams him for being ridiculous and says that the vase probably just slipped. But when my father asks then what happened to the garage, is she left speechless and looking at the doll inquisitively. It isn't until a few days later, in broad daylight in the kitchen, when I'm gonna go get some cereal for the morning, that a drawer jumps right out. That's just it. It pushes its way out. With such a loud noise, I run out screaming like a little child. I was beyond terrified and told my mum that there was something weird going on. I had my own suspicions. Ever since we bought that doll, had weird stuff started to happen. So, I did what any sensible person would do. I put it up on eBay. I didn't say it was cursed or anything, I just put up this porcelain doll that my mum had fixed up on eBay. And would you know that we got a buyer within the first 10 hours. It was actually quite a competitive bidding process, and it sold for roughly $100. I packed it away without telling my mother what happened, 
and sold it. When my mum came home from work, one of these days, she didn't even notice it was gone, as I had fetched the key and replaced it with the old Chinese bell. It's only after about a week, I think, did she ask who had moved the doll, or Shirley, as she affectionately called it. I said that it broke, and so I put it in the bin last week, and that, well, it was gone now. It had been taken away by the bin man. She was a bit upset by this, but honestly she didn't really seem to care all that much. Perhaps she was starting to believe that there was something more spooky with the doll than we originally thought. I was glad to be rid of it, and made sure to put in my eBay listing absolutely no refunds. My parents still don't know about this, and I think it's better that way. I don't want them to try and track it to buy it again. A few years ago, I was staying at my great granddad's house because he had gone into a home and we needed someone to look after it. I had always seen and heard strange things happening around me, but had just put up with it to help out my family. One day I was out in the sunshine room having a coffee and reading a book, when I realised I needed to go up the street to get some things, so I went into the house and closed all the doors inside. It was a pretty warm day, so I wanted to close everything so the air conditioning worked best. I closed the doors inside, lock the front and back door, and leave for about 15 minutes. Come home to chaos. Unlocked the back door to find every single door inside wide open, cupboard doors as well. I went through the house, checked the front door, still locked, and felt something move behind me and spun around, but there was nothing. By this stage I was pretty freaked out, so I started to back my way out the back door again. I could see shapes or shadows moving at the edge of my vision, but when I looked directly at them there was nothing. So I backed my way out to the sunshine room, and then noticed the book I was reading, the coffee cup, ashtray, and everything that was on the table was scattered on the floor. Looked inside, it was the same. Not ransacked, but random stuff was scattered. I saw more movement inside it too. Multiple movements. Just shadows, but there were several of them moving around inside. I didn't want to leave because I still was trying to convince myself I was imagining things. Or maybe I had walked in on a home burglary. Once I heard the door start to close and open again, I was done. Nothing could make me walk back into that house alone. I sat outside in the sunshine room for about an hour, waited for my wife to come home from work, and watched these shadows wander around my house and have a spectral party or whatever the whole time trying to convince myself there was another rational explanation. I heard my wife's car pull up in the driveway and everything disappeared. No movement, nothing. She walks in and asks me why I trashed the sunroom. I was 25 and a male by the way. It never happened again after that, at least not to that extent. When I was really young, I was really into strawberry shortcake. This was when I was about five or six. It so happened that she had a younger sister named Apple Blossom, or something like that. Well, I had an Apple Blossom doll that spoke when you squeezed her. She had a button in her hand as well. I think, but I don't remember that much. Point being, I shared a room with my three older sisters and above our bed we had a hammock made out of a curtain for our stuffed animals. I was playing on the bed with Apple Blossom all by myself in the room, and I remember making her speak with all the buttons, and then she said this, Praise Satan, you're going to hell, in this really deep and creepy voice. Now I knew damn well that that was not one of her sayings, nor was it a normal thing to happen. So I threw the doll off the bed and ran and started crying. Of course, no one believes me. To this day, I stick to that story. My oldest sister has the doll in her apartment, and I still find it incredibly eerie. 
This happened to my wife's friend. One day, she was driving home from work, in a quiet area, when an unmarked police car sped up behind her and began flashing his blues and signaling for her to pull over. To this day, she doesn't know why, but something wasn't right. And after a call to her boyfriend, he gave her a contact for our local police station. She rang the number and asked about an unmarked police car wanting to pull her over. The person on the phone did a quick check or possibly contacted a dispatcher and they were told to keep driving but stay calm. Within four minutes, four marked cars came speeding up behind and before she knew what was happening, boxed the unmarked car in and forced it to stop. The dispatcher told her to drive around the corner and to stop. And as it turned out, the guy was being hunted by the police for pretending to be an officer to get young women to pull over when he has them at gunpoint to do all sorts of insidious things to them. I was at a mate's house spending the night when I was in middle school. As expected, we'd stay up all hours, which didn't matter most of the time, except the bathroom was right near his parents' room. About the only time we'd get in trouble was when someone would wake them up when nature called. To avoid this, we'd go out the basement door and just pee in the woods. The door stayed unlocked most of the time because we'd managed to lock ourselves out more than once. This was also compounded by the fact that we all wandered out to find something to do in the woods on a regular basis. This night his older brother was home and kept barging in the basement door and raining chaos from above, so we decided to lock the door to deter him. Not that it would really have kept him out, but at least he'd have to use the key, and in doing so it would take the fun out of barging in. About midnight, we hear the handle jiggling, and I didn't think too much of it, figuring it was his brother. After about five minutes of on and off handle fondling, we finally hit the door and yell for him to stop, and I met with quiet. There's no response, no more clattering of the handle, and that's great, so we can move on, right? Well, about 10 minutes later, it started again, and the process repeated. This went on for about two hours until finally, after telling him to stop, we just said screw it and ignored it. He continued for about half hour after our last attempt for him to stop, and then just gave up. Well, fast forward to about 9 a.m., we were just stirring and one of my mates had to go to the bathroom. If you've ever had a sleepover like that, there are bodies strewn wherever there's a space. And once the first person starts walking around, it kind of stirs the nest. We all started stretching and making our way to relieve ourselves of the soda that we'd been binging on the night before. And as I walk out, I grab the door handle to close it behind me and noticed it felt rough. After looking at it, I saw the space around the keyhole was all but destroyed. There were giant scratch marks on every surface and the metal guides were bent and skewed. I asked my friend that lived there what happened and he said it was the first time he'd noticed it. Not really wanting to get blamed for something his brother did, we went upstairs and told his parents about the night before. After his dad went down to see what we were talking about, he went completely white and ran upstairs to call the cops. Evidently, someone had been trying to force the lock open while we were all inside. That actually happened to me more than once on different occasions. What completely freaked me out about this time was the person knew we were there and we knew someone was trying to get in. So he repeatedly tried to force his way inside. God knows what sort of person that was or what they had in mind for us. You know how people say, trust your gut feeling? Well, here's how I learned to trust mine. When my girlfriend and I were traveling in Australia, we were both there on our working holiday visas and met each other at work. After nearly a year, my girlfriend's visa was about to expire, but mine lasted another six or seven months due to working on a farm prior. Since we had spent most of our time in the beautiful city of Sydney, we were ready to see other parts of the country too. What most backpackers do is pay a company that takes them up the east coast by bus or simply rent a camper van and drive to the coast themselves. We chose the latter option with a few changes. 
We were going to start the journey by bus up to Brisbane, and from there rent a car that would take us all the way up north, from which eventually we would take a plane to Asia. So the day came. We said goodbye to our workplace and our friends that we had made during our stay, and went off. After a few days in and around the area of Brisbane, we started looking to rent a van. Not having a lot of money, and wanting to save what we had for other adventures, we eventually settled on renting the smallest and cheapest Subaru that we could find, since we figured it would be uncomfortable to sleep in the car, and bought a tent instead. This car was even so small that it came with a map, showing where we were allowed to drive, and which roads that it would be too tough for. So the journey continued, and with the help of our rental, we had the option to visit less known or touristy places. We saw some really amazing things along the coast, and since we had enough time, we decided to see some of the real Australia. You know, the rustic desert with red sand that you'd see on postcards of the outback. So the next day, we changed our course from north and started going west. The GPS was showing a drive of about 10 to 11 hours, until our goal, which was a small town in the middle of nowhere. Not too bad. I was the only one with a driver's license, and I had done trips like this before. Leaving the coastline behind, it didn't take long for the climate to change, and soon we found ourselves in places just like those on the postcards. The ocean wasn't the only thing we left behind. It seemed the further away we got, the lesser civilization we saw, which was understandable and we had gone way past the area we were allowed to drive in with our little car. We weren't worried though. The roads were all kept well, and this was our trip which we were going to enjoy. This meant taking a lot of breaks for pictures, and to take in the new landscape and scenery, which in turn made it a longer drive. Eventually the sun started to set, as we headed towards the horizon. Now here is a thing that you need to know about driving in Australia. You need to be very careful while driving at night, or preferably do not drive at night at all. This is due to the amount of kangaroos crossing the road, with some of them being as large as a fully grown man. How many people told me this before our trip? So many. But during our drive, we were so far away, and hadn't seen a single one, and figured that people must have been exaggerating. Now as the sun started to set, and we actually saw a kangaroo for the first time, it was nice, seeing it up close. We soon realised what people had been telling us was true. With the sun gone, the sides of the road started to fill with them. It was almost like something out of a vampire or zombie movie. After a few close calls, we had to slam on the brakes to not hit any crossing animals and we eventually just kept a very slow pace. This, of course, meant an even greater delay in our drive. After a while of driving like this, and when daylight was completely gone, we came across a small town. Being quite hungry, and not knowing how long it would be to the next town, we decided to stop and see if we could find anything to eat. This place we had just ended up at gave us a bit of a freaky vibe. Maybe it was just because we were in the middle of nowhere, and we both came from the city. Perhaps it was because the place was so badly lit, and there probably wasn't more than 10 houses. My city brain probably freaked out a bit and thought, this looks like the hills have eyes. At least it had a bar and a restaurant. The place was probably frequented by truckers going through these roads. We entered, and I guess every person in the town must have been there which weren't much, along with one or two truckers. My girlfriend and I stuck out like sore thumbs. As soon as we sat down and ordered our food and drinks, the people next to us, it may have been some sort of family, sat down by the table next to ours. We ate, I didn't pay them much attention. That is until I heard something they said, which made my ears grow wide and a chill that ran down my spine. Now I can understand that people living out there would have fun spooking the tourists coming through, and I'm not sure if that's what their intentions were, but it got my attention as they uttered Wolf Creek. If you've been in Australia, you may have heard about the story. I don't think any traveller there hasn't heard of it. 
Looking back at it, it sometimes felt like a mythological creature you would tell your kids about to scare them. Except, these stories are true. Wolf Creek is a movie based on a serial killer who targeted backpackers traveling in desolate places in the 90s. I guess it happened in various ways, but he often incapacitated and tortured his victims before ending them. As you can understand, it is a nightmare for backpackers. However, fortunately for everyone, he was eventually caught and imprisoned. What this group of people next to us were talking about was that the police had arrested the wrong guy and that the real Wolf Creek killer was still out there. I was sitting there listening to every word coming out of their mouths while my blood was running cold and trying not to seem disturbed in front of my girlfriend who didn't notice the conversation taking place. Again, I'm not sure if they were just full of rubbish and were trying to scare us, but I was getting freaked out. As we finished eating and paid, we were leaving and the trucker sitting in the bar turned to me and said something like, you really should stay here for the night. You're a fool if you're gonna try and drive away at this time. Well, I sure as hell wasn't gonna stay there with my girlfriend. I turned the door handle and walked out. Before driving off, I actually checked everything about the car to make sure no one had been messing with it while we were eating, but couldn't find anything wrong with it. As soon as we left the town, however, I started to understand what the trucker had been saying. If it was bad before, it was worse now. Kangaroos were running everywhere. I'm pretty sure we hit one small poor creature. And I'm saying pretty sure because I didn't want to get out to check even if I did. That's how bad my gut feeling about this place was. It made us eventually have to drive even slower than before. And we were now pushing 30 kilometers an hour, a grueling and excruciatingly slow pace. This was absurd. At this speed, we would have to drive all night just to get to the next town. When I looked back in the rear view mirror, I started to get an even more uneasy feeling. Bright headlights coming up behind us fast. At the time we had been driving for about half hour out of town and I couldn't see any trace of anyone, just us and another car out of nowhere. And I do mean nowhere, except for our lights and the lights following. It was pitch black. You might think I was too chicken to consider our circumstances. I bet you would too. You couldn't see anything except the part of the road that was illuminated. As the car came closer and closer, I got tender and tender until it was right behind us, lighting up our whole car. Then it just passed us. It was a massive pickup with a metal bumper guard in front of it. You could see how this guy could keep his speed. He had no respect for wildlife. As we took advantage of the moment and picked up our own speed to follow the car, we could see the unlucky kangaroos flying off his bumper guard. Well, that was all the excitement we had for the night. After a few hours, we could see the lights from the next town, which we had discovered was a bit larger and had a nicer feeling to it. We took into a hotel for the night and slept far into the next day. We weren't in a hurry to leave. In the morning, we took our time in staying in the area and having a late breakfast. The GPS said that it would be at least another four hours until we could reach our destination. We were on the road again in the afternoon, and in daylight, we could see what happened to the unlucky kangaroos that had been in the wrong place at the wrong time. The sides of the road were filled with carcasses, some new, some old, some probably had to have been there for years. We later learned it hadn't rained in the area for about six years, so everything that died didn't decompose, but simply dried out. And I guess there weren't that many animals out there that would eat bodies, at least not this amount. The stench was horrible. Every time we took a break and got out the car, I really don't think there was an area next to the road that didn't have some sort of bones or fur for the entirety of the drive. As the sun started to set, we got a bit anxious again. We really didn't want to have to redo the experience from the night before. The signs were all there, and the kangaroos were lining up like zombies just as before. However, as the sun had passed beyond the horizon, we saw our goal. We had chosen this town since it was known to have dinosaur tracks and fossils in the area, and we noticed as we entered between the buildings, and it was way bigger with more people and tourists than the town that we had been driving past. 
That doesn't say much. You could probably walk from one end to the other in 10 minutes, but compared to the other towns, it was a metropolis. We asked around the town hotel and the camping ground if they had any space for us, but they were all fully booked. Understandably, we were probably the last people to enter for the day. At least we got somewhere to eat while we planned how we would sleep for the night. Since we didn't want to be rude to other people living there, we thought it wouldn't be a good idea to sleep on the street in our car and both agreed not to sleep in the tent we bought because of snakes and spiders, you know? Well, eventually we came up with the idea to park just outside of town and sleep in our car there. We found a spot that usually must have been used for truckers to park. It was dark, so I'm not sure, but the ground was made of asphalt and we could just make out the signature of a bus standing in the dark. The bus driver must have either slept in there or in the hotel. In front of us was the town, illuminated by the streetlights, and behind us was absolutely nothing. It almost felt like being on the edge of drifting into the universe. If you would have continued in the direction right back from where we were standing, you could probably have driven for days without seeing another human or anything man-made. The map showed no roads or settlements in that direction for ages. We made ourselves as comfortable as we could in our small car and said goodnight before trying to fall asleep. Maybe it's just something that automatically kicks in at night, but it's a really uneasy feeling that was upon me. And the conversation between the people yesterday was still ringing in my ears. The townspeople had long since gone to bed and it was dead silent. Actually, everything was dead silent. Not a bird or insect was making a sound, not even the wind. Before I started to doze off, I looked at the dashboard. 12 a.m. it said. Suddenly my eyes flung open and my girlfriend grabbed my arm and was holding a tight grip, looking at me with fear in her eyes. What's wrong? I don't know. Something feels wrong. I understood. I could feel it too. The bad gut feeling was turned up beyond maximum. The clock on the dashboard showed 2 a.m. I looked around through the car window. It was difficult to see anything since we had fogged up the glass with our breath. The bus, however, was no longer in its place. It was now just us. We were all alone. Suddenly a loud bang sounded from right behind the car. It was the sound of metal to metal and I could feel my heart beat so hard and could even feel the pressure all the way down to my toes. Go, my girlfriend screamed and I couldn't agree more. I stuck the keys in the ignition and started the engine as quickly as I could. It's lucky we had rented an automatic car because I'm sure I would have panic stalled in another one. All the birds were screaming and shouting as loudly as they could from the bushes and trees around us. They all knew that something dangerous was about. Dust and gravel were flying around the tires as we sped out of the rest stop. I didn't really know where we were going, but I just knew that I wanted to get the hell out of that place. We reached the town center. In the square, we looked around to see if anyone was following us and noticed several other cars and trucks being parked around us with people sleeping in them. This gave us some assurance that our hearts could slow down a bit. After a while sitting there, going through what happened, I guess my girlfriend fell asleep. Or maybe, like me, she just appeared to be. I kept at least one eye open until it started to get light out about three hours later. When we both awoke again, the sun was already far in the sky and people were out and about on the streets. As I was about to open the door, I noticed a large greasy handprint on the driver's side window. I'm not sure if it was there when I eventually closed my eyes a few hours earlier or if it had been planted there afterwards. As I looked at the dashboard again to see what time it was, something else caught my attention the indicator showing which doors were open, and it showed that the door behind me wasn't closed. I looked behind it, and sure enough, when I stepped out to check, I noticed that it wasn't. I'm not sure if it was us who didn't manage to close it completely the previous night, but what I do know is that we had slept with the doors locked, but if one door had been open, that means anyone could have gotten in. Yet again, I don't know if someone was just playing a prank on us, or if it was something more sinister. When we talked about it later, my girlfriend had been thinking 
It had something to do with aliens. She had quite a phobia of them, and there have been several strange sightings in the outback of Australia. However, my thoughts regarding the night's events made me remember the conversation about Wolf Creek Killer again, and how they said he was never caught. What scared me the most about this incident wasn't the loud banging behind us or the handprint on the window, or even that the door had stayed open. What scared me the most was that both of us, me and my girlfriend, felt that unexplainable feeling of terror that made us wake up in the night. It's that feeling that is now convincing me. It wasn't just someone playing a prank, but actually someone wanting to harm us. After we had woken up in that morning, we had our breakfast and everything felt great again and the gut feeling that I had been having for the last two days was gone. The rest of our trip went great, and without any more scary incidences. However, it did teach me one thing, to always listen to my gut. This happened about three years ago, right at the height of Pokemon Go's popularity. I played it regularly with my fiance, Luke, we decided to get clever and instead of walking to make our eggs grow or whatever, I would just drive around the residential streets slowly at 15 miles an hour. We always drove the same path and did this several times. At the time we lived in a very small, one traffic light town. The town was primarily low income families and we usually played Pokemon at about 10 to 11 p.m. As did several other locals. Without other entertainment, it was a fairly popular game around town. This night in particular, I'm driving at the normal path with Luke. We're catching sick Pokemon left and right and hatching eggs like crazy. We pause in the water department's parking lot to catch our 217th Ekans and drive for 10 more minutes and park next to an empty lot. Across the street is a normal residential landscape with houses and whatnot. I'm catching my first Pikachu and I'm stoked as hell when some guy drives by in a beat up SUV slows down and asks me if I'm okay. I smiled and flashed my phone screen and told him we were playing Pokemon. When he said something like, okay, have a good one, but he seemed weird. So we leave and make our last stop around the neighborhood, pausing as we get to various Pokemon. And after about 15 minutes later, we're back in the empty parking lot because there's a few more to catch. Suddenly the house across the street starts pointing beams of light at me, very small, which is strange. So Luke and I noped out of there. As soon as we did, the beat up SUV is behind me again. I didn't even see where he came from and I turn onto the main road to head home. And I didn't even realize anything was wrong at first. He pulls up next to me and I can only see a male driving and a female passenger. The driver is shining a blinding light at me through the window as we drive. At this point, I'm simply pissed. I keep asking Luke why this guy has a problem and I'm telling him to tell the guy to get lost, all the while getting ever more scared. I'm a fairly confident person, but not a confident driver and I would no idea who these people were or why they were doing this to us. But I do know that it's not the same guy that asked if we were okay earlier. I don't wanna drive home because I don't wanna lead them to my house, but I had no idea what to do and decided to drive to the police station but there was no one there. The parking lot was empty and the lights were off. We have two police officers, so they both must have been out on patrol. I was shook. I was raised in a large city, so tiny town living and no police at a station was a very foreign concept to me. I had no clue what to do, so I drove to the little hospital and managed to lose them. My fiance and I immediately changed seats without speaking, and we sat there for 15 seconds and then pulled out. He's behind us again, and he's aggressive. So I called 911 at this point and began crying to dispatch, telling them there's a crazy guy following us. At this point, Luke is flying through the town at random, running red lights, speeding at 70 plus in residential areas, tearing through people's lawns. And this was seriously as insane as it sounds. Everywhere he went, the follower went too. Every time we sped up, so would he. We had no idea what he wanted, but we knew he wanted to hurt us. We could just feel it. At one point, we're tearing through yards in my car and the guy manages to box us in. I'm still on the phone with 911 and we're stuck between his car and a couple of trees. 
immediately upon stopping the guy jumps out, as does the female passenger and two very large male passengers in the back seat. Luke immediately pulls out his gun, points at them and screams, get back, now. They all bolt into their vehicle and take off. I am absolutely shaking and sobbing at this point talking to 911 and the lady finally asks me where I want the cops to meet me. I tell her the local gas station. We're there within 20 seconds as were the cops. This town is seriously so small. I don't know how the cops didn't see us or intervene while we destroyed dozens of yards at midnight and drove extremely fast and recklessly. Seconds after we pull in so does the SUV and the guy jumps out and begins to rush my car but the cops stop him. They talk to him for a while and we're just sitting in our car shaking. The older cop finally walks over to us and says, so did one of you pull a gun on him tonight? We were shocked. That was the only thing he asked us. We told him yes and explained everything. The cops went to speak to him again, came back and basically said the guys thought we were casing his home because he kept seeing our vehicle pass it. The cops told us we were lucky. He decided not to press charges because Luke pulled his gun. My car had decent damage from driving through trees and bushes and stuff, scratched up, pretty sure the guy wanted to beat our asses. And the cops tell us that we're lucky. We're so shaken and scared. We didn't argue anything and left when they allowed us to, but not before they ran all our info and made us feel like criminals, like we were childish and stupid for playing Pokemon. The cops openly laughed at us. We went home and stayed up literally all night long, taking turns peeking out our window as we were convinced they were going to drive around, find my car and harass us. The next day we had high-tech security installed. I've since seen the guy and the girl several times. I worked at the school and they had young children. I'd never seen or interacted with them prior to this day or after, but I also know who they were, so I'm glad I don't live there anymore. I also never played Pokemon Go after that night. I should also mention that I understand why the guy thought what he did, but I don't think his reaction was remotely justifiable. I was on a road trip with a buddy, and one stop we had to make was to visit his mother's grave. It was in Colorado in February, so the whole cemetery was covered in a few inches of snow. We talked to the caretaker, and she pointed us in the general direction. His mum's grave marker and those around hers were the metal plaque kid, flush with the ground, so no good references. We shoveled snow for a while, being as respectful as we could, and kept walking past this patch of snow that looked like it was made by some birds after they'd rolled around in it. When we looked at the snow patch from the right angle, it looked like a human figure with a hand extending. We shrugged it off and followed the direction it was pointing. Not five minutes later, we found his mother's grave, right where the figure was pointing to. This happened around seven to eight years ago. I remember the events leading up to this in great detail, and I'm interested in what other people think of the situation. At the time, I was 17 to 18, and I had a little Russian doll on my bookshelf that my mum got me from one of the friends she made in Russia when she studied abroad there. It's super tiny, about three inches tall, a female dressed in traditional Russian clothes. The doll was sat atop a shelf, about three to four inches back, and behind something else. Now. Ever since I was little, the hallway upstairs creeped me out. My bedroom is up at the end of the stair hallway, and the hallway leads up to my bathroom. In order to go to the restroom at night, I have to go through the end slash corner of the hallway. It kind of started subtly. Occasionally, around the ages of six or seven, I would wake up to find something had fallen. I had a 3D heart puzzle on my makeup box, and I would wake up to find it had fallen on my dresser and split right down the middle. Sometimes I would wake up to find the tiny doll lying face up on the floor. This is where I started to get a little bit creeped out. The doll was set further back than it was tall. 
If it fell over, wouldn't it have fallen onto the floor face down? Why always face up? This is where things got really freaky, and I'm still really creeped out by it all these years later. I was heading upstairs to the aforementioned bathroom, and I turned on the lights to the hallway before I walked up. Like I said, the hallway always freaked me out. And the lights turned on, and then flashed out. When I flipped the switches off, the lights flashed back on and then off again. I figured, eh, it's an old house, whatever, and went to the bathroom anyway. The bathroom light switch did the same thing. I got frustrated by this, so I started to angrily flash the light switch on and off very quickly. During one of the bursts of light, I saw a young man in his early twenties standing directly behind me with straightish black hair nearing his shoulders. He didn't feel super scary or dangerous or anything, but I still panicked, told my dad that the lights were having issues, and when he flipped the hallway and bathroom light switches, the lights turned on with no issue. I still feel that awful creepy feeling of being watched in the hallways to this day. I felt like I've been watched my whole life while in that hallway. The heart puzzle and the doll started to fall a little more frequently after that. I was clearly not happy about it, so when my parents were gone, I yelled for whatever it was to leave me alone. After that, the puzzle and doll stopped falling. I even moved the tiny doll downstairs and out of my room. The awful part of the top hallway still gives me this super creepy feeling though, like I'm being watched. I've had friends who've stayed in the guest room downstairs and say that they felt like someone was watching them all night and that they heard lots of creaking noises. What this comes down to is am I safe? I mean, I've grown up in this house, but is this ghost slash spirit slash whatever biding its time or is it all my super active imagination? Is it just me being paranoid about seeing things that aren't there? Or is this a nice ghost? Or are there other things I need to worry about? I'm just scared. Scared of being judged. I'm curious what people think. Did the ghost actually leave? Was he not real to begin with? Do I need to worry? I'm a French student doing a masters in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I live alone in an apartment in a building where there are only students. I'm 22 and enjoy a peaceful life. I live in a relatively calm and good neighborhood and the only noises I've ever heard are the trams or parties in buildings since there are plenty of students here. One night around 10, I hear a knock on my door. I live on the third floor and to get to my front door, you have to open the main door which needs a key. Then you need to open the door to my corridor with the same key. So people who want to come into the door must have a key. Call me or ring me at the door so that I can open it for them and then let them into my apartment. Nothing of this happened. I just hear a knock on my door one day. I usually open the door without a second thought, whether it's my landlord or a neighbor asking for something. As I told you, I feel pretty safe in the building and I could also take care and defend myself in case anything happened. But this time, for some reason, I had a bad feeling. I didn't move at first. I thought the person would just leave. I'd finished my assignment. However, the knocking continued. I didn't move at first. I thought the person would just leave and I'd finished my assignments. However, the knocking persisted for 30 seconds. So I yell out, yeah, in English. And the person knocking didn't say a word. I say in English again, who is it? The voice answers in English. It's Uber Eats, which is weird because Dutch, always speaking Dutch. And I recognize the voices and accents of everyone on my floor who have access to this floor. So it wasn't a neighbor. It wasn't my landlord. It was someone coming from Uber Eats apparently. But the issue is I didn't order Uber Eats that day. The voice was unfamiliar in case it was a prank or neighbor pulling a joke. It was also a deep voice, at least 40, and definitely a smoker. I didn't order anything. You must have the wrong address. A few seconds later, the knocking continues, 
and the same voice says, I'm pretty sure you did. I have an order under your name. I start panicking. I look around and pick up a knife in case he breaks the door because the knocking was getting louder and fiercer. I check if the door is locked and it wasn't. I was literally 10 centimeters away from him and my front door was the only thing keeping me from him. I'm glad it didn't open from the outside as you need a key to open it, even if it's not locked. I step back and ask again, what's the name? He seemed to be thinking for a few seconds. Then a final knock occurs. It was loud and it translated some of the anger and frustration. Finally, I hear him descend the emergency stairs next to my apartment. The steps were heavy footed and clearly the person was in a hurry. I don't know what he wanted or what he would have done to me if I'd have opened the door. I still don't understand how he got through the original two doors and why did he specifically come to the last apartment on the third floor? Did he try others before? I posted about it on the WhatsApp group we have in the building and no one saw anything suspicious. No one opened the door for anyone. Anyway, I'm lucky for my instinct telling me not to open the door and I'm glad that I listened. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they are just terrifying looking collectible dolls. Basically, purchasable nightmare fuel. She'd bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary. So this creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular living dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted the doll, there was an offer. She gladly said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer, and to her surprise when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush her hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. Yes, there was also a picture of the doll on Amazon, and my aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's still just sitting in the closet. But a few weeks later, as a special Christmas gift, my aunt let me open the box. The doll was still inside. My life hasn't always been the best. A rough childhood and a string of horrible abusive relationships made life that much harder and I was feeling as though I had hit rock bottom. The fall before college, I landed a job to save up on money and keep my mind occupied. December 2018, my job had recently laid out the plans for a company merge and was in desperate need to hire more help to make sure things went smoothly, both with the upcoming merge and the holiday season. I was about three months into this job and at the same time, very comfortable with the position and duties. My co-workers were very friendly, and though we could be classified as a dysfunctional family, we made it work. My boss had just hired a few more people, a couple of cashiers and a shift supervisor to get trained as quickly as possible and throw into the mess. All the new people seemed nice enough, and though I'm naturally a social person, I'm not very trusting. A week goes by and I'm put on night shifts with the new lead and my first thought of him was, the guy seems pretty easy going and harmless, but I was wrong. He seemed to be having a hard time adjusting and to make him feel better, I would help him learn the job as best I could. He seemed friendly overall, 
always willing to help you if you needed it, and the regulars liked him. Everything was going smooth until my gut told me something was up. I personally wouldn't like to talk about myself because it makes me feel selfish, so my co-workers' knowledge of my personal life is limited to what I'll be doing after the shift and that I had a younger brother who came into the store often, so when this man started to mention things, I never told anyone at the job unless it was necessary, as I was uneasy. My first paranoid thought was that he had found my Instagram, which at the time was public. I don't have other social media, but figured it was just that. Weeks go by, uneventful aside from the man making comments about his sex life to me and describing his ideal woman. He tries to befriend my little brother, a minor, and asks him to hang out with him sometimes. This man is in his 30s. My brother told me he didn't like the guy the moment he met him because he gave off serious creeper vibes. Maybe it was the inappropriate jokes, advances, abuses of power, talking bad about me, talking about him, or him constantly asking other employees where I was, even if I wasn't scheduled. But I started to feel very scared around him. I had co-workers come to me the day after their shifts with him, uncomfortable because the whole night he'd been going on about me when he barely knew me. He'd watch security cameras and call me from the office just to try and talk to me about the job and personal life. I didn't have a vehicle at the time, so my current partner, who was a saving grace, would pick me up from work. He had found out about my boyfriend. He threatened to beat him up on multiple occasions, as well as throwing things in my office when my boyfriend would pick me up from work. One night in particular, my brother got out from his job at the same time we closed and decided to swing by and pick me up. The psycho got in his car and followed us home. I was so scared I didn't sleep all night. I was terrified to work with him and asked my boss to throw me on morning shift so that I wouldn't have to see him. Thankfully he did and I only had to see this man for a few moments as I was leaving to go home. After the merge, everyone went their own ways and I haven't seen him since. But he has tried to contact me via social media recently asking how I am and where I'm living. Because of him, I'm always watching my back. Especially in my hometown. I'm paranoid he'll find me. This story took place when I was around eight years old, in my old neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got it into his house, his uncle was there watching TV so we couldn't use it. Today I now know that he wasn't his uncle, because my older sibling, which knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed to search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older TV, but we could use it. And something started moving all the things around and we thought it was a rat, so we didn't mind at first. Then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter and eventually found this one male doll that was around two feet long. It was all torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We sat it down and decided to go hook up the TV in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing, but then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, probably us. We were both freaking out but we knew we had to get away from the house. As we were leaving, we heard the doll laughing through the window. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents returned. Ever since that day, I've always experienced weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things like clown videos, which I think is a serial commercial from the 70s. 
I ignored all these weird signs for the rest of my childhood. And we recently met up, since we went to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked him if he remembered them. He said he did. But I wonder if this will be the end of the story. I certainly hope so. I used to deliver hotshot freights across the Great Plains slash Minnesota area. One night around 2 a.m., I was hauling across North Dakota trying to reach Montana by morning. I was delivering a particularly valuable tractor part that a farm desperately needed for the following day. I began to notice some highway hypnosis sneaking up on me, but it didn't really bother me because I'd been through it hundreds of times before. Anyone who's driven across North Dakota knows that it's incredibly flat, like really flat, and there also tends to be very straight and long roads. It's somewhat easy to see things on the road as far away, even at night. I noticed something long on the road, spanning my entire lane approximately half a mile in front of me. I slowed down a little and prepared to move into the opposite lane, thinking it was some retread off a blown tire. As I got closer, I noticed it was two people laying head to toe across the entire lane. I swerved into the other lane successfully avoiding them and came into a complete stop, but they didn't move an inch. I was about to back up and check up on them, when I remembered a story that an old grey beard colleague of mine told me. He told me that in certain remote areas, people will lie down in the middle of the road and wait for a car or truck to stop and see what's going on. At that point, the road liars, along with whoever else is hiding in the nearby bushes, will beat the crap out of the driver and steal the vehicle, leaving them stranded in the middle of nowhere. I decided not to back up. And when the two people in the road saw me put my truck back in gear and drive away, they both got up and walked toward the shoulder. I called the police and explained what happened. But we were so far away from civilization, I doubt anything came of it. Thanks to that old gray beard, I got to keep my truck, my job, my teeth, and my life. This happened a few months ago. It was a few days after Christmas, and my mum had asked me and my girlfriend to house it and watch the dogs for her while she went on vacation for a week with her boyfriend. We agreed, and the first few days were pretty uneventful. My mum's house is on the edge of a rural upstate New York town, so really the only big thing that happens is road work. It was probably the third night there. My girlfriend and I were on the couch, she was on her phone and I was playing Pokemon Shield on Switch. It was probably around half midnight when suddenly we hear footsteps from outside. Someone with really big and heavy boots had stepped up onto the porch. The way my mum's house is laid out is that there's a couch against the wall with windows on either side of it. On the other side of the wall is the front porch, so this guy was right behind us. He stomped around some and then got really close to the window on the left side of the couch and grunted, Ugh! Hell! in a deep, angry voice and stomped off. My girlfriend and I froze, but after five seconds of registering what had just happened, we got up and turned off all the lights in the house and went to the laundry room where no one would see us. After a little while, I decided to go out a different room and look out the window to see if we could turn any of the lights back on. When I look out of it though, I see this big burly guy shuffling down the sidewalk opposite our house. In his hands are a plastic bag. Keep in mind this is half midnight in a rural backwater town, so none of these stories are around. Keep in mind it's half midnight in a rural backwater town, so none of the stores around are open for him to get one. The guy continues doing this awkward shuffle while holding this bag then suddenly starts moving nimbly in an almost cartoony manner across the street towards the parking lot near my house and vanishes. I go back to the laundry room where my girlfriend is and tell her what I saw. I bring her back to the window as I was looking out to see if we can find him again, but he's still gone. We check other windows around the house to see if he's out any of those. My girlfriend is looking out a window on the other side of the house when she says she sees him, but he's walking away. We try to collect and discuss whether or not we should call the cops. 
when suddenly we hear knocks on the door on the other side of the house. We race to the door, and we can hear the doorknob jiggling. Thankfully it was locked. One of my mum's dogs starts barking and going insane. He's a small rescue dog that growls at anything foreign. He has a loud, ear-piercing bark, so I think that scared him away. We called my mum and asked her what to do. We debated calling the cops, but cops in our area are notorious for not really doing their job, so we decided against it. My mum also encouraged us not to because she thought it was just some drunk and or high person that didn't know what they were doing. While this wouldn't be the first time someone showed up drunk at the door in the middle of the night, gotta love small towns, right? I don't think he was. I don't know what the guy's intentions were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. I live in a house with my great grandparents, my grandma, my mum, and my brother. My great grandparents got this house 50 years ago and had lived in it ever since. My grandpa passed away last October and his stuff is currently in my closet. I stay in an old storage room so everything that is not put to use is in my room. Ever since I got this mirror around Thanksgiving from my grandmother, crazy stuff has been happening. My grandmother got it from a kinda sorta not completely abandoned house. The landlord moved out, but left some of his stuff there, so my grandpa took it, which is where the mirror came from. My grandparents lived in a bungalow behind the house. When cleaning out the house, I saw the mirror and asked my grandmother if I could have it, because I thought it was pretty. I do not know how old the mirror is, but it is kind of worn down. Anyway, so the mirror was sitting on my bookshelf because I hadn't hung it up yet. One day, I was cleaning my room and the mirror literally flipped and landed in the middle of the room. There is no logical way that could have happened because I did not make any movement that could have caused it to flip and it went too far. It's almost as if someone pushed it. The mirror didn't crack, it was completely fine so I didn't think much of it and put it back on my dresser so that it wouldn't fall again. About two weeks after that, my deodorant was sitting on my headboard and flipped and landed in the middle of my room. At the time, I was on the phone with my boyfriend, so I told him about it, put the deodorant back and joke around a bit and that was it. Now, we are gonna talk about things that have recently happened. So me and my boyfriend have basically been stepping our relationship up a bit. And any time we talk about something like that, or we talk about it over the phone, weird stuff happens. I went to shower while I was Skyping him, and my phone started messing up, so the call ended. I ran out the shower and called him back, but it took me about five minutes. One night, after we were talking about things, it was around 3.30 a.m. He was asleep and we were still on the phone. My closet door started wiggling back and forth and that continued all night. I can't remember anything else that happened because I've gotten so used to it by now. Tonight, I was just in bed and a bottle that was on my headboard fell right on my head. Maybe it's because I was moving a lot and it freaked me out, but I'm not sure. I was talking to two of my friends about it, and they told me someone's story about what happened at their house. My first friend said my Harlequin doll fell off my shelf dresser. It's old, and it has a huge mirror and two shelves on each side, and landed on my floor. So she picked it up and set it on the dresser. When she came back, it was sitting on my bookshelf. My other friend said she woke up randomly in the middle of the night and she couldn't move and saw a white figure in the corner of my room and she started to cry. Both of them just informed me now about this tonight. I also have a porcelain doll that I got from my fifth grade dance as a prize and I'm in 10th grade now. I do not know the history of the doll, but it had moved before. It's a doll with brown hair and she's a bridesmaid. 
it started turning and moving of its own accord. So my mum took it and put it in the top of her closet. Maybe the beginning of this year, and we haven't taken it out since. But I've been talking about it. Now I'm not sure if I want to take it out or not. I honestly do not know what to do at this point. I don't know what's going on, and it creeps me out. I'm scared to move it. I'm a 19-year-old female from Maryland. I don't live in Baltimore City, but right outside of it, and have friends that live there and find myself in this city quite often. Now, if you know anything about Baltimore, you've probably already made the decision to never go there. I thought I was used to it. I thought. My friend and I were driving to pick up another friend from a neighborhood we've never been to. My friend was giving me directions from her GPS, but we ended up on the wrong street. The streets in this city are very narrow. Cars parked on both sides of the street it makes it worse, and if you're lucky, it's a one-way street. Well, this street wasn't a one-way. There's a cop car stopped with hazards on, going the same way as me, but on the left side of the road. I'll be honest and say that I'm not the best driver, so I felt uncomfortable trying to go around it. It's fine, I'll wait. Well, a car coming the other way decides to try and maneuver around us both. He can't get around me. By this point, there's another truck waiting behind me, so I can't back up. The guy trying to get around me tells me to back up, but I can't, so I tell him to back up. He refuses, so I just sit there and can't stand up. Out of nowhere, I see a guy rush at my car on what must have been PCP, with a homemade wooden sword and nunchucks, eyes bulging from his head, hitting my windshield, telling me to back up my car so the guy can go through. I can't back up, but wouldn't try to fight this guy even if I did have a weapon of my own. He's clearly killed before with no remorse, and all of his neighbours went inside so they weren't a witness to anything that this guy was about to do. Turns out he's a heroin dealer that was mad. So many cars were pulling up on his block and hurting his business. So the crazy crack fiend with the bamboo locking sword, let's never meet again. And I sure as hell won't be going back there. Last August, I got a pet hamster. Her name was Halo, and I loved her very much. I hadn't had a pet of my own before, so this was very exciting for me. She was always a very observant little ham. She was always very curious and inquisitive. Heck, if she'd only been a boy, I'd have named her George because of how curious she was. Sadly, one day, something fell in her cage, and she started acting funny. I noticed she was very lethargic, stopped drinking entirely, and my mum worried that she might have come down with wet tail, which is a deadly disease in hamsters that can kill them sometimes, in as little as 24 hours. It was a stressful period of time for one of two reasons. First of all, I was worried about taking her to the vet, because it would put her under even more stress, and decided that when she got up for the night, if she didn't drink, I would euthanize her at home with CO2. However, my dad decided it wasn't a good idea, and my choices were to let her suffer at home or take her to the vet. I was a stupid kid, and decided to sleep on it and let my poor hamster suffer. And I regret it to this day. Now, the second reason, that's where it got scary. Once she fell ill, the knocking started. I was going to bed after hand-feeding Halo some carrots, as they had high water content. I rolled over and started getting comfortable to go to sleep and let the darkness take control. But then I heard a knock at my door. I said, come in, as it was probably one of my parents coming in to talk to me to say goodnight. No reply, no door opening. I thought maybe they couldn't hear me over the noise of my air purifier, which I also used as white noise, as my house is very old and creaky. So I yelled louder that they could enter but still heard no answer. I heard the knock again. My mum is hard of hearing, so I suppose it was possible that she didn't hear me. I opened the door, but no one was there. At this point, I realized it was my dad playing a trick on me, which he enjoys doing every once in a while. Although I did find it strange he'd do this during such a stressful time. 
and said into the hallway, Dad? There was no reply. Dad, I know it's you. You can come out. Still no reply. I started getting scared. Dad? Please come out. You're scaring me. It isn't funny anymore. Now, if I ever said that what he was doing was upsetting me, he'd immediately stop. And it definitely couldn't have been my mum because she hated getting scared and had never tried to scare me. I ran back to my room, locked the door and turned to look at my poor Hammy, who was curled in a ball. Five minutes later, the knocking started again. And this time I realized the sound was coming from my window. That didn't ease my mind at all, as anyone could easily shatter the glass. So I hid under my covers and prayed. The next morning I woke up and was dismayed to see Halo's condition hadn't changed at all. I went downstairs for the day and tried taking care of her. When I went to bed that night, I heard the knocking once more. This time I was genuinely freaked out, even more so than I had been the other night. I turned on another white noise machine and tried to go to sleep. By the next morning, I was so overtired, Halo started looking a bit better. And that was probably the only reason my sanity lasted. The knocking didn't stop that night. Five seconds would pass and then I'd hear it again. I went to sleep downstairs that night. Fortunately, whatever was doing it did not follow. The next morning, Halo was even worse. She wasn't even moving. We took her to the vet and she died that day. Somehow she had broken her back and got paralyzed from the neck down. We still have no idea how it happened. That night the knocks stopped and never came back. Sometimes I still hear her wheel squeaking. My dad said it might have been a sign. It was the weirdest and scariest thing that's ever happened to me. And hopefully I never hear those knocks again. Today, I was on my way home. I was about one mile from my apartment, cruising with my windows down, smoking a cigarette and listening to some Kendrick Lamar. I noticed to my right was a white car that had sped up to be next to me, but I didn't think too much of it. As I approached where I would usually turn left into my complex, I decided based on their behavior, this wasn't the best idea. At this point, I still had not looked at the driver or looked over to acknowledge them. I continued past my usual turn and got to the next light, where again they pulled up next to me. I heard a girl's voice, so I assumed it was some girl, just talking amongst themselves, trying to keep up with me. After the light turned green, I started speeding up to a max of 80 to 85 down a residential road with only their car and my own. The car was neck to neck with me the entire time, not trying to race, not trying to overtake me or anything, but completely matching my speed. I think, okay, this is fun, because I'm going fast with a stranger. It's cool to experience it. But once again, I became wary when we approached the next light, and I decided to turn left to basically circle back to my house, thinking they'd had their fun and I had obliged long enough that she'd been next to me or following me for at least 10 miles at this point. They immediately switched two lanes over to get behind me. I turn left and speed up once again and they once again match my speed exactly. I still have not looked at the driver at this point and want to get into the furthest left lane to be able to turn down the street towards my house, but she was directly next to me so I couldn't get over. We approached the lights and it's red. I slow to a stop and still don't look over. Pulling a drag from my cigarette and looking for a song to pick, I suddenly hear a girl's voice ask, Where'd you get your glasses? It's at this moment I decide to look over and see a single driver, a girl, most likely in her mid-twenties, early thirties. The first thing I notice about her is a wide-eyed stare. If you've ever seen a psychotic break in a person or drug-addicted-induced psychosis, you'd be able to know what I'm talking about. I went to college for psychology, so that plays a little bit into my decision of making this as well. I also noticed that her back windows were completely tinted. It was a pretty nice car. That also means she has access to money. After I made those assessments, I responded, over there at the Vista station, or whatever it was, and she replies, oh, and is still staring at me. Then she asks, 
Are you from here? No. I've been here for a while, but I'm not from Alaska. The next question she asked is really what put me into suspicious and alert mode. Oh, so you have a lot of friends. Actually, she made it more of a statement, not a question. Still wide-eyed. At this point, I'm sort of like, all right. But then she asks, so what do you do for fun? Uh, well, I mean, I go to concerts. But this question weirded me out too, because it's like, it's been a pandemic. What I do for fun now isn't the same. Oh, okay, she replies and just stares at me. Then I wait for her to continue or something. And then I decide to ask, how about you? She replies, oh, uh, I don't really do anything. I've never been to a concert. Right. At this point, the light finally turns green and I think that's the end of it to suddenly hear, you're really sexy. Now here's the thing. I'm not one to take compliments well, so I awkwardly reply, thanks. And then she asks if we want to exchange numbers while we're driving and she's still screaming matching my speed. I hesitate for a moment, but for the sake of the experience in the story, I say sure. She says, okay, and I pull forward and she pulls behind me. I drove her about two miles before reaching the point basically where she had started following me in the first place. I pull into another little neighborhood that has an office and a parking area in front. I purposefully park in a spot so that she can pull up next to me and tell me her number on my left side. She then pulls into a spot basically two spots away to the right of me. Weird, I thought. It's about 5.50 or 6, pretty dark out and I roll down my passenger side window. She rolls down her window and is staring at me and goes, What? I, I didn't say anything. So do you want my number? She stares at me, thinking, and then goes, you just take my number. I pull out my phone and I look at her and say, go ahead. She stares at me and she says, one second, and then reaches around for a maximum of four seconds before she sticks her hand out the window with a piece of paper. Come here, she says with the first smile she's had the whole time. Why, what's up? Come here, she says, still smiling, waving the paper. At this moment, I notice one hand is out the window waving the paper, while the other appears to be reaching into the door compartment below the window. Looking at her, I say, I don't know, can I trust you? I mean, I don't see why not, she says with this look of total fake shock that I would say that. I don't know, I don't know you at all. Now this might not sound like I'm overthinking things, but based on her facial reactions or lack thereof, I don't feel like she was hurt that I was weirded out, and that's a bit weird. At this moment I say, sorry I watch too many YouTube videos because it's true. For the past five months I've been obsessed with interrogation videos and other criminal investigations, and she just says, okay just give me your number. Are you ready? I say. She stares at me. I start listing it off, and she stares at me again. After I'm finished, her stare continues. Oh. And my name is Jack. Jack? She repeats. Yeah. She waves the paper again. You don't want it? No, just text me and I'll have your number. She stares at me. Okay. I then say goodnight, that I have to go, and she starts her car back up and basically pulls up behind me, stopping for no reason. I notice she's looking at my directions as I peek at my driver's side rear view mirror. I then start to reverse so she knows that I'm not sticking around and pulls out the way. I head home, park, and make sure no one followed me, and head up to my home. I don't know who or what was behind those tinted windows, and I don't know why she wanted me to come over there to get her number in 2020. Sketch. I don't know why she made the statement about me having a lot of friends. I mean, I can speculate, but either way, I think if I had made the wrong decision tonight, I could have ended up dead or somewhere I didn't want to be. Till this day, when I tell people about my breathing dull, they don't believe me. They just say it was me, my vivid imagination. But my dull breathing was real, and the most vivid memory of my childhood, especially with unexplained experiences. The first time I saw the doll was at a flea market, with my mum and grandmother. 
and I fell in love with it. It was a big doll, only about 14 inches. After begging my mum to buy it and failing, my grandma bought it for me. Man, I loved that doll like it were a real baby. I bought it baby clothes, shoes, bottles and the like. Took him everywhere. I named him Rocky, and people often thought I was holding my baby brother. Well, one day, I was outside playing with Rocky, and I was being a little too rough with him, throwing him up in the air and letting him fall repeatedly, scolding him when he wouldn't sit up on my bike. So I got him and threw him as high as I could and tried to catch him, but he slipped through my hands and to the ground. I picked him up to dust him off, and that's when I heard him breathing. It was heavy and angry and fast, like someone would sound if they were really annoyed. I threw him on the ground and stare at him shaking, absolutely terrified. I leave him there and run inside. My mum asks me what's wrong, and when I tell her she laughs it off, as if it were nothing. Says I'm being silly and to go and pick him up and bring him inside. I refuse to touch him, and I screamed when she tried to force me. She gave up, picked him up, and looked at him and said, See, he's just a doll, stuffing in plastic. He's not real. He can't breathe. That was the last day I ever played with dolls. I gave him to my brother for a home economics project he had, where you can carry around a bag of flour and pretend it's a baby, or something like that. Anyway, he used its head and attached it to the back of the flour to make it more babyish. He ended up getting extra credit for that. A few years later, the whole Chucky craze and killer doll movies were all the rage. All the while, I had a real demon doll of my own. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first, and thought the car was on the other side of the highway. But sure enough, a white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed, at least 90. It's worth noting for later that I was also driving a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk drivers slash idiots in the middle of the night, so I pulled to the side of the road to let him pass. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or someone else. The dispatcher answered after telling them which road and exit mile marker I was at, and told them they would send a car. The police station was only a few exits away, so I figured they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern Pennsylvania, and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting close to speed, so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams, making it uncomfortable to drive, and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan, and had just called about a different white Ford sedan. So I grabbed my registration from my glove box, when suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked to be the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought it may have been a police car, as they had a roof rack, and it could have looked like I had reached for my gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for a second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt with me and assured me that they had sent someone. Sir, we've sent a trooper out to find the car, Okay, I only ask because someone is following me and acting super weird. It could be a cop, and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Are you getting pulled over? No, they didn't turn on their lights. Let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking again, the car sped up towards me and stopped inches from my bumper. Again, their high beams were on me again, and they slammed their brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure it's not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. What's going on? Did you honk me? No, 
That's the car behind me again. I don't think it's a cop. I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that is him behind you. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I was getting pulled over and maybe a ticket. Up until then, I was going at the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I'm getting pulled over. I'm speeding, and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate, and the person behind me kept up with me. The speed limit was 55, and they kept on my bumper the entire time, but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit and bail out, and they followed. At the next exit, I took the off-ramp and continued onto the on-ramp, and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought I was about to go to Wawa, a convenience store slash gas station that's pretty much the only populated place in southeastern Pennsylvania at 3 a.m. But the dispatcher thought it would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person, trying to send the police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the police station. Realizing that I was one exit away, I told her I was going there and said that she would have the troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off the exit, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights and turned into the parking lot. The story kind of ends anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went out to find the car and I stayed with the third. I thank the dispatcher and her supervisor and the straight trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow or testify, so I can only assume the person didn't get caught. One night I decided I was going to take my mum's brand new car to go get my boyfriend. She was fine with me taking it because my car was blocked in. It was a nice summer night, so I was driving with the windows down. A little bit of background on how my boyfriend's section entrance is set up. When you pull in, there's an intersection right away. The road that you use to pull in on has a stop sign about 20 feet after you pull in. On the same road, just the other side also has a stop sign for outgoing traffic. The road that crosses the ones you pull in on doesn't have any stop signs. My boyfriend's road is the first one so when I pull in, I stop and have to make a left and this house isn't far from it. It's basically A plus with north and south having stop signs and east and west not. I pull in, stop at the stop sign and there's a white Ford work van outside of the very first house to my left. I waited for him to go for about two minutes and he wasn't moving. I figure he was waiting for someone to come out the house. So I slowly go up to make the left turn and I turn past the van slowly, and because it was tight, I squeezed. When I'm passing at him, he yells, hey, and that absolutely scared the crap out of me. So I quickly get to my boyfriend's house and have to parallel park because his driveway is taken up. Where I'm parked is across the street from his house. And once I'm parked, I immediately lock my doors and pull up my windows. I can see the van driver from the side mirror parked where he was. My boyfriend was outside working on his car and I immediately call him because I was freaking out and didn't know if the guy was gonna come around and try and take me or something. As the phone's ringing, I look in the mirror and see the brake lights go on. Then the guy starts reversing down the road at 50 miles an hour. This road has cars parked on both sides and I watched him come up the street and in my head I was like, don't hit my car, don't hit my car, I can't get this car fixed. Thankfully, he doesn't hit anyone, but he stops outside my car. By this time, my boyfriend is right in front of my car and he goes up to the guy's window. This was the conversation. You okay? Need any help, mate? Uh... You lost. You need directions. Anywhere I can help you? He doesn't say a word. My boyfriend steps back. The guy was in park, but he was hitting the gas pretty hard, so the engine was roaring. Then it seemed like he tried to shift either into drive or reverse, but he ends up staying in park and revs the van three more times. He finally shifts in reverse and flies backwards only to pull over and park on the side of the street I'm parked on. 
I told my boyfriend I don't know what in the hell was happening, and he said to run inside and tell his mum and sister to lock the doors. That's exactly what we did. He was on the phone with the cops as well as his sister. His mum called his brother and told him what was going on, as he lives less than a minute's drive away. This is what I witnessed when I was watching outside the window. The drunk guy gets out of his van but is still running and the driver's door is left open. He walks around my boyfriend's truck, pulls on the handle like he's trying to get in, then walks around again, then pats the truck's driver's side fender like it's a good dog, then walks back to his van, tries to get in through the passenger side but I think it was locked since the door wouldn't open. And my boyfriend's brother comes round and screams at him. He must have scared him because the guy ran into his van and drove off right away. We all went outside and asked my boyfriend what he thought was going on, and he told me that when he asked the guy if he needed help, the guy wasn't making coherent sentences and seemed to be extremely intoxicated. He also said he thought the guy was attempting to break into his truck. This whole thing lasted about 20 minutes, and for the final 10, my boyfriend was on the phone with the cops, telling them the guy was doing some weird stuff and that he was drunk, and the cops said that there were three guys on the way, but never showed up. A few minutes later, there was this family walking their dog and asked if we saw the crazy guy. They said that they saw him hitting cars that were parked and apparently he crashed into a pole but reversed like nothing happened. My boyfriend later told me that the guy was speeding through his section at 90 miles an hour and he went around it about three times. He had stopped outside of that one house and that's when I pulled in and everything started. The guy never came back for the rest of the night at least. I looked on the local news sites and couldn't see anything about him. So I guess he got away with it. Weird, creepy, drunk dude. It's about six o'clock on a Friday night and I've just gotten off work at a bad part of town. I'm driving northbound on a two lane street when I reach the part where a freeway off-ramp merges into my lane. I'm driving in the left-hand lane when I see a black Mazda sitting at the stop sign waiting to merge. He starts to roll forwards, and before I've even passed him, and I'm thinking he doesn't see me because of the sun or whatever, I'm getting closer, and he's still rolling it down, so I give two short honks, nothing drawn out or excessive, to just politely beep him and let him know that I'm there, and that I'm not planning on spending my Friday night in a car wreck. He keeps rolling, not even slowing down, so I simply drift halfway into the lane to my right and checking my mirrors beforehand and go around the front of his car. I'm slightly annoyed, but no big deal. Let's just get home. I get maybe less than a hundred feet down the road when I hear someone yell something like, you think you're the police or something? I look to my right, as my windows were rolled down because of a heat wave, and I see him along with me on his windows rolled down too. He's angry, Hispanic, and tattered up. He's wearing a wife beater, and he has a shaved head. So I'm thinking he's a gangbanger because gangs are rampant in this part of town. He continues to ask if I think I'm a cop, and I say I don't want an accident. I know it doesn't make sense, that's just what came out. We repeat our cop slash accident line a few times where he does something that scares me crapless. He takes his right hand off the steering wheel and reaches towards his waist. And I immediately think, this guy's packing heat. I don't know if he actually has a gun because I can't see his hand and I don't really want to find out either. I start pulling back because I'm not about to give him a clean shot. It's a good thing too because he starts driving into my lane but it's a slow enough drift that I'm not sure he's trying to run me off the road. Either way, I've pulled back far enough that he swerves into my lane and misses the front of my car. He swerves back into the right-hand lane and starts to slow down too. Since I started decelerating earlier, we're both slowing down, but I'm still putting a distance between our cars. The second scared crapless moment occurs when he slows to a complete stop. I stop too because there's no way in hell I'm passing him. So he's there in the right hand lane and I'm just sitting here in the left hand lane, about five or six cars lengths behind him and we're both just stopped in the middle of traffic. Cars are backed up behind me and there's a stopped car to my right and there's a concrete barrier between me and oncoming traffic. 
So this freaks me out because I feel completely boxed in. Nobody honks, nobody moves. We're all just waiting to see what this guy does. The adrenaline is pumping through me and I see my options. One, he gets out of his car and I see a gun and I'm ducking behind the dashboard, flooring it and running him down. Two, if he gets out of his car and I'm letting him get close, flooring it before he can get back to his car and he better get out of the way or I'm running him down. Three, if he gets out of his car and just stands in the middle of the road like an idiot, I'll consider running him down just in case. Now I'm not a violent person by nature and I'm still shocked that I considered running down another human being as an acceptable option, but take in mind I was under a lot of pressure. So I'm sitting there in my car waiting for him to make his move. It felt like an eternity, but it was probably less than a minute before he starts moving again. He's driving well under the speed limit and I'm thinking he wants me to pass him, but I failed my first driving test for going too slow and I can go slower than him. I'm probably driving at 20 in a 45 zone and by the time we reach a traffic light, he goes through and I make sure I catch a red light. I pull into the next AM PM because I'm still pretty rattled and grab a corn dog and wait for my hands to stop shaking before I head home. If we ever meet again, I better hope I'm behind the wheel. Otherwise I'm out of options. Last year, I signed up to work my local maid cafe for a big convention. I was so excited I landed a spot on their list. The maid cafe here is pretty kind of exclusive and runs the comm business in the area, despite there being another maid cafe. Around the time I got accepted, I had just started dating my current boyfriend a few weeks before the con. We're long distance though, and since we literally just started dating, he didn't have enough time to make it down here for the con. I was not shy about showing him off though. It was pretty well known I was taken before it even began. When I got there, I could tell the maid cafe was understaffed that year. See, because of some background stuff that I probably shouldn't discuss, the maid cafe was practically forced to open a second cafe spot at the same convention. I think someone said they had double the new hires. Anyway, because we were understaffed, training for the new hires kind of got pushed under the rug. It was fine for the first half of the day because we just walked around, advertised the cafe and stuff, but they had to throw us in at the cafe at some point. That's where I met my first customer. Off the bat, he looked very out of place. He was older than my grandpa. He had a black shirt with a wolf howling at the moon and he was using a walker to get around had a big vase filled with what looked like roses made out of sheets of plastic, maybe cellophane. I'm not really sure what it was. I'm not trying to judge anyone who fits this description, but he just didn't look like the type to go to anime conventions, let alone the maid cafe. He was sitting there making the roses and one of the butlers in charge of the new hires told me to take care of him. Mind you, I had like the absolute bare bones in terms of training. I did the typical maid cafe thing, took his order, got him some food and drink, did the little hand thing to charge up the food or whatever, and then sat and started to talk with him. He seemed nice at first, gave me one of the roses despite me being visibly uncomfortable accepting it, as I don't like to receive gifts from strangers due to past trauma. At this point, I didn't even let my boyfriend buy me things. Also, he wouldn't let me talk. He kept saying random facts and would always say, I bet you didn't know that. Not a lot of people know that. Mind you, I'm almost done with college. I'm an educated woman and feel pretty insulted. At the same time, I'm trying to get a word in because I want to keep up with the cafe standards and prove to my superiors I can hold the conversation with strangers. I keep trying to talk, but I'm constantly interrupted. Finally, he says, Hey, do you know what third base is? I know what second base is, but I can't keep up with the kids in your lingo. Is third base intercourse? My mouth hits the floor. I guess he could tell the question made me uncomfortable because he gave me another rose. It felt very much like I was being bribed not to tell the other maids about that wildly inappropriate remark. But all it did was distract me from a very different kind of unease. I stayed anyway because I didn't want to be seen as a bad host or have him complain to my superiors. And he started to talk about women. Again, I wasn't allowed to get a word in because if I would have, I would have a thousand percent told him I had a boyfriend. 
It feels like every time I tried to bring it up politely and casually, he would just change the subject, almost as if he knew I was simply waiting to say it. He told me he was always a loner, that women don't like him because he's an artist, and that he bangs beautiful women, women prettier than me. I'll bet my money he was expecting me to be grateful he was giving me the time of day when he could be out banging a total 10, eye roll. But then he never stayed because women inherently don't like commitment. Like, I wish I could figure out what the hell he was talking about. Then before I could reply to his mad ravings, he told me to give him my hand. I was very confused and it was more of an a demanding tone. He told me to give him my hand. I tried to give him the hand with a ring that my boyfriend gave me to ward off creeps. And the older man said, no, not that one. I gave him my other one. God knows why I didn't just run away. I think I was scared. I would be one of the ones who got in trouble for some reason. He opens up my palm and starts tracing the creases in it. I think he's doing palmistry or trying to. So I thought I finally had a chance to ease into conversation. I asked him if he was doing palmistry, to which he got really offended and said, No, I'm reading your aura. I know people who read auras and I've never seen them do it like this, but okay. This is probably the creepiest part. He tells me I'm vain, that I value looks, but I can look past it. Gee, thanks. That I value intelligent conversation and want someone knowledgeable in my life, and that I want someone who appreciates art like me. That I want someone generous and kind who can protect me. The nail in the coffin was when he told me I was suited for an older man. I wanted to cry because while he was describing my boyfriend to a T, I knew he was trying to tell me he was perfect for me and that I needed him in my life. It was like he was using it against me, and I think he could tell he once again made me uncomfortable, because he then told me I liked animals. He then said, I'll take you to feed the ducks sometime. A sentence that still haunts me to this day. And he wrote down his full name, three email addresses and two phone numbers and told me to keep in touch so he can take me to feed the ducks. I ended up giving the cafe all the information he gave me before ripping up the card on my bed and crying in the hotel later. Thankfully, another customer came and I moved to sit in between them. You could tell the older guy was angry with the other guy. I tried to keep conversations with both of them, but the younger guy didn't talk much. He ate and left. Another maid started talking to the older guy, and I took the opportunity to escape, I mean, escort the younger man out. On the way out, one of the maids asked if I was okay. I guess the staff noticed I was uncomfortable. I did try to hide it. With a smile, I whispered I wasn't, and that I was going to have a meltdown. She told me to go on break, to which I did end up breaking down in the parking lot. But that's for other reasons I won't go into here. After a drink and a treat from a nearby coffee shop, I resolved myself to go back inside. The rest of the weekend was wonderful. I got to talk about memes with a table. Someone at my table drew a picture of me, and I got a photo taken with a really sweet girl and her hilarious dad. I bonded with another girl, over long distance relationships, and at the end of it all made $20 in tips. The only thing I didn't like about that weekend was the maid that ended up taking my spot next to the old creep tried to defend him to the other maids. The staff at the cafe immediately banned him once he left. Apparently he even cracked a joke about making me uncomfortable on his way out, but she was telling everyone how nice he was to her and trying to convince them that he shouldn't be blamed. This went on for a few days. She told me they talked about paranormal stuff, murder mysteries, which made my spine crawl a little. I mean, I like that stuff too, but not when a creepy guy, almost as old as my grandpa, tries to talk to me about it. She brought the guy up at a group dinner and said she felt bad for him and that he was so sweet and shouldn't have been banned. I was pretty angry she was standing up for him after crying and reliving my story to the table she didn't talk about him again. It was pretty clear what he did was indefensible. I gave her the roses he gave me and things seemed to be okay from there. But the creepy old man at the maid cafe seriously bro, get a life. Let's not meet.
I used to work in a carousel at a shopping mall in France. It was the third biggest in Europe, so rather large. The first time I worked there, as it was owned by my parents, I was 13, and not really used to Parisian life. I came from a small town in the south, so it was really weird for me to be here. But one day a guy, between 20 and 30, was sitting on a bench and looking at me. He seemed quite nice, and at first I thought he was a parent or something, looking at his child. He was completely alone and only looking at me. I awkwardly smiled and said, hello, thinking he needed some help. He kept smiling, and that's when I started to get scared. But I kept doing my work, looking at another bench to make him understand that I was uncomfortable. Five minutes later he moved, sitting on the bench that I was looking at. He wasn't really smiling, and looked kind of disappointed. So I started looking up, because people could look at the carousel from there. When I looked down again ten minutes later, the guy was gone. I thought he left, but he was still looking at me from the first floor, with that horrible smile. He stood there for a whole hour, and continued changing so I would notice him. When I left work, he followed me, so I told my co-worker to accompany me until I got home. That was a real creep. He came back in on random days and did the same thing. But now it's been at least six months and I haven't seen him. Last year I also had a pause and decided to go to the nearest bookshop. And as I did, I found a book that I really wanted to get, a Tolkien book. There was a guy there who looked at me and made a Tolkien reference. I laughed and just left. 20 minutes later, the same guy was on a bench next to me at the carousel and looked at me and smiled, and he came to see me and asked for my number. I said I didn't give it out to strangers, but he kept insisting. Then I asked him his number and told him that I'd text him when I was done with work, but of course never did. He came back two days after, but I didn't see him. I noticed him following me when I was in the same bookshop. I was moving randomly to see if he was really following me. He was. So I walked towards him and asked why he kept doing this. He then said he was in love with me, that I reminded him of his ex-girlfriend and that he wanted to get to know me. I said I was in a relationship and he said it was okay. He could be a third wheel, that I could just text him whenever I felt like it. Maybe a month after that, I was going to a big convention where I was cosplaying as a random maid. I was holding a free hugs cardboard with some random drawings on it and with two friends and we were having a ton of fun. When out of nowhere, someone jumps up and hugs me. It was this dude. We called security and he kept screaming that I was the love of his life and that he would end his own life if he couldn't be with me. Apparently he asked my coworker why I wasn't there and she thought he was a friend of mine and said that I was going to a convention. He came to search for me. I never saw him after that and then I blocked his number. Final story happened in December of 2018. I had two jobs, but in the same mall. A guy of about 20 to 30 with long hair was sitting on a bench next to the carousel and kept on looking at me. He sat there all day. Who does that? And I noticed that he was sometimes raising his phone and moving it in my direction, almost as if he were taking pictures of me or filming me. I was 15. You're not supposed to take pictures of minors. Plus, the way he looked at me was very strange, and I even caught him licking his lips while looking at me. I felt really uncomfortable, but kept on working and said nothing. The next day, I was working my other job, which was another carousel, and was only here for the Christmas holidays. I didn't see him, but when I left my job and was waiting for my parents to get ready so that we could go home, the guy sat next to me really close and asked for my number. I said no and he looked down, very disappointed, and asked if I was working tomorrow. I asked, I don't know, why'd you ask? Because I like your body. He then stood up and left. I really didn't want to go to work the next day, so I told my co-worker Lionel, another co-worker, about what happened. I could hardly sleep that night. I was really paranoid about everything around me. Then I saw the guy and told Lionel to ask him to stop following me like that. He came back with a huge smile, saying, and I'm not kidding by the way, it's okay, you two will go on a date. 
Apparently, the guy told my co-worker that he was a friend of mine and was messing with me. He said he was really shy and playing this game, so he would have this confidence to ask me on a date. I felt so strange, as if I was going to fall. I stopped working that afternoon and told my parents. They told me to stay with them and immediately tell me if I saw the guy again. As we were leaving, I swear, I saw the guy with a hoodie under the rain. The next day, I was with another co-worker and saw the guy on the bench next to the carousel. When I told her, she ran towards him and yelled at him stuff that I couldn't hear, but I could see the guy's face and it was priceless. She returned with a big smile and the guy left me alone forever. Apparently, she said that she knows where he lives and if he saw him around, she will blow his brains out. Thankfully, I never saw the guy again. In any case, three creepers. Let's not meet. Three years ago, my wife and I purchased our first house, located in what is known as the wealthy area of the city. We wanted to buy our home somewhere nearby my mother's house, as she has lived alone since the death of my father. My mother was born in South Africa before the polio vaccine was available, and she was one of the many to be affected by the disease. She's paralyzed from the waist down, and has spent her whole life on crutches or in a wheelchair. That being said, my wife and I wanted to purchase a house nearby so that we would be able to visit often and make sure she feels cared for, as well as having her independence respected. We found the perfect place within a five minute drive from her house. I always worried about something happening to her, so I felt comfort knowing I would be able to quickly head over to her place to help, no matter how minor or severe the problem. However, I was never prepared for what happened one night in the summer of 2019. I found myself facing my biggest fears and having my courage tested. In the midsummer, I dropped off my mother at the airport so that she could fly to South Africa to spend time with her sister and my cousins. Since my oldest brother lives in another city, and I live so close, I naturally took on the responsibility of caring for her home while she was away. I visited it twice a week, making sure to water the plants, get the mail, check the answering machine, and all the other mundane tasks that come with owning a home. Luckily, the year prior, I had a security system installed within our home that gave me remote access and viewing of the property. This system would alert my phone that I kept at my side at all times of any activity in the house. If a window was opened, one of the entrance doors was opened, any alarm was triggered, I would know about it. It gave my mother, my wife, and my brother and I peace of mind, knowing that she sat in what we considered a fortress of safety. The only thing I didn't have installed in her home were security cameras, which I would come to rip myself apart over later in the story. My own home has cameras inside and outside, watching everything from my motorbike in the garage to my sleeping dog in the living room. For some reason, I never thought to put something like that on the outside of my mother's house. Maybe it would be a bit much and an invasion of privacy. On the other hand, she and I would always know who was at her door and who was around her house. Fast forward a month, my mother is enjoying her time away and things are going well at home. It was a weekday night when I came home from work, went to the gym, watched a movie with the wife and got ready for bed. It sounds like a normal night so far, doesn't it? Well, just past two o'clock in the morning, my phone starts making the sound when it receives a notification from an app. I ignored this, thinking it was an email or Instagram notification and tried to go back to sleep as I average five hours of sleep a night and value it dearly. Shortly after dozing off, my phone goes off again, and again, and again. My wife rolls over and says, turn it off, I'm trying to sleep. She always gives me crap about my volume being on at night, but I do it in case of an emergency or if my mother is trying to reach us. Thank God I left the volume up, because when I started to roll over to close the notifications I received, it hit me as suddenly as a car crashing through my living room. I had a series of notifications from the security system installed in my mother's house. Just then, the company who monitors the system calls my phone and I answer. The lady on the phone informs me that the home alarm is going off and the motion detector in the basement has picked up several time-stamped instances of movement. 
she informed me that they dispatched a security patrol to my mother's house to check. With the lady still on the phone, I looked at the notification from the security system and saw what she was telling me. I checked the status of her door locks and the system said all doors were indeed secured. Without looking any further, it hit me. Someone or something is inside the house right now. Keep in mind, I was abruptly woken up from sleep and was told my mother's house may possibly being broken into. I hadn't had the chance to shake off the mind fog yet and therefore I came to the incorrect conclusion that my mother was in danger. I jumped out of bed and sprinted to the garage, only stopping to slide on my shoes and grab the keys to my car. Luckily, I had my pajama pants on because it was a chilly night. I didn't stop to grab a shirt, jacket, or any type of weapon at all in my rush to get to my mother's place. Fortunately, I kept a heavy duty flashlight in my car, similar to what policemen carry that I use for urban exploring. I put the flashlight on my lap, put the car in drive, and put the pedal to the floor. I nearly tripled the posted residential speed limit in my haste to reach the house. Let me tell you, nothing wakes you up more than trying to drive like you belong in the Fast and Furious crew. I reached my mum's house and noticed that all the lights were off as I'd left them. The alarm was going off and it was insanely loud. Neighbours were starting to come outside, but no security patrol cars were in sight. My car is also super loud and it has an aftermarket exhaust system installed. So I was convinced that whoever was inside the house had to have heard me come flying into the cul-de-sac. I grabbed the flashlight in my hand and ran to the front door while unlocking it from my phone. I ripped the door open and found myself staring into the dark entryway of my mother's house. And I'm ashamed to say, I was frozen solid as ice. I was terrified. Being 25 years old at the time, I'd never faced anything so daunting before. I've been through a fair amount of intense and wild situations in the past some which have put my life in danger, but nothing scared me more than staring into what I was convinced was the doorway to unimaginable horrors committed in my childhood home. Keep in mind at this point, standing in the doorstep, my brain had still not sent me into the calming reminder that my mother was actually still relaxing at my aunt's beach house in South Africa and was not inside the darkness I was currently staring into. With the image of my mother in my mind, my courage was slammed into place. One iron bolt at a time, I entered the house. I would like to say that I slowly and methodically searched the house one cupboard at a time, starting with my mother's room with the backup of the security patrol with me. But instead, I thundered into the basement like a missile locking onto its target because this was where the motion detector was triggered multiple times. I guess my fight or flight reflex absolutely pulverized the button that sends me into flight mode because I went on the hunt instead of checking on my mother's room. I quite literally punched the switch that turns on the lights in the basement and braced myself for a fight to the death. To this day, I'm not sure if it was my relief or my horror that I saw absolutely nothing. Not a damn thing. I looked around where I stood. The windows in the main area of the basement were intact the motion detector lights were flashing its lights and notifying my phone of my own movement in the house. The thought came to me that only an idiot would be standing out in the open in the basement. So I ran back upstairs and into the kitchen, turned on all the lights as I passed. Once I had the biggest knife from the kitchen block in the kitchen, I made my way to my mother's room, slowly and methodically checking every corner, doorway, closet, and under every piece of furniture I could until I was sure the main floor of the house was secure. The intruder had to be in the basement. I was sure of it. I pulled out my phone and silenced the home alarm so that I could listen for any type of sound. I made my way down the steps as quietly as possible, knife in hand, gripped so tight, it was making my knuckles crackle and pop. I checked the main room again, under the pool table, behind the couch, and then the bathroom. Nothing. I checked the first bedroom and found nothing. I turned to go down the hallway and felt my heart try to tear out my chest when I saw that the door to the guest bedroom was closed. I couldn't for the life of me remember if I had closed it before or during a prior visit. 
I slowly walked up to the door, trying my best to listen to any sound, but all I could hear was my heart pounding in my chest as if I was standing directly on the San Andreas fault during a big one. I took hold of the door handle and ripped it open. I cannot confirm or deny the possibility that I crapped my pants when I saw the figure standing at the other end of the room, catching the image of a giant knife in their hand. I had to give 110% in my effort in order not to faint at the sight I saw in front of me. I was beyond terrified. It was now or never. I wielded my resolve back together, one steel plate at a time and reached for the light switch as I could fight the intruder to their death. The light came on and I dropped to my knees in tears. I was staring face to face with my own reflection. The closet door in the bedroom was sliding mirrors, and in the dark, they displayed what looked like a serial killer to me. I opened the closet door and full on started crying in relief as I found nothing. I heard the car door close outside and figured it was the patrol car arriving on the driveway. I walked down the hall and passed another set of sliding mirrors that led to a storage area, a hot water tank and the furnace of the house. I stopped just as I passed the sliding mirror as the same intense shock of fear came rushing back when I realized I didn't check that room. I turned and put my hand on the mirror to slide it, and again found myself frozen. Have you ever found yourself in a situation that intense and wild, that all you could do was make nonsensical noises? Through tears, maniacal giggling, and the use of every curse word available, I slid the mirror aside and stepped into the storage area but it too was empty. I turned and sprinted with all my might upstairs and outside onto the driveway, where the patrol car was parked. The so-called security officer standing there must have been younger than I was. If you picture the word intimidating in your mind, this man was the opposite. He was chubby, smiling, and had a mega baby face. He looked like he was there to greet you as you entered the house. I checked my watch and the man had arrived a full hour after I told the security company dispatch to patrol. I'm not normally someone who bashes someone who's a professional that involves risk and danger, but I couldn't believe how long it took them to get there. I started laughing like a loon when this guy asked me if everything was okay. Maybe the intensity of the situation I just came out of caused me to lose it. I explained to the guy I checked every crack and crevice of the house and found nothing, no thanks to him. I started to doubt and had moronic and rude thoughts of questioning the usefulness of this pretend security officer that I am admittedly ashamed of until this guy asked me if I checked the garage. My smart ass grin disappeared instantly as I grabbed for the garage door opener in my car and pressed the button to raise the door. Slowly it opened to make myself feel like a bigger ass. I found myself standing behind the security officer as it did. The garage is very clean and we're organized. I take pride in the fact that when you open the door, everything is in sight. The space is open and it's virtually impossible to hide in. I walked through it, peeking inside the car and then leaving the garage satisfied that it was empty. The security officer gave me some paperwork to sign, basically saying that he did in fact respond to the home alarm being triggered. I brought it to his attention that the basement motion detector had multiple timestamps where it recorded movement, and I got worried as we watched his face turn pale. He informed me that the detectors used by the company don't rely on movement, but monitors changes in temperature in the room to reduce false reports of movement. He told me that if a person moves in front of the sensor, the thermal signature from their body and the movement of said thermal signature together disrupts the reading of the room and triggers the notification I received on my phone. With that information dropped on my lap, he got into his car and left. I locked the house up, left the outside lights on and rearmed the security system. I leaned against my car, staring at the house, wondering how in the world the alarm could have triggered, seeing as it's based on movement and heat without someone being present. Then again, maybe someone was, I'll never know. Just before I left, I verified the status of the specific sensor that was triggered on the security system console, and it showed that it was operating correctly. 
The very next day I had security cameras installed on the outside of the house in the garage and in the area where the motion detectors were located. It has been two years since this event and I still haven't told my mother, brother or wife about what went down. Was there really someone there? Or was there a supernatural reason behind the alarm being triggered? I hope that I never go through that again. Sometimes it's best not to find out the answer. When I was very young, my grandmother had a painting that hung in the living room of her old house. The painting was of two women at a piano, one playing while the other listened and pointed at the music as if in the act of teaching the song. I would often sleep over at her house as a child. I have countless distinct memories of seeing the figures of the painting move at night, not in an intelligent way, but in a sort of acting out the scene sort of way, almost like how a gif on the internet is nowadays, constantly looped actions. The woman playing the piano would begin to actually strike the keys and tap her foot to the rhythm, while the other woman would nod her head in approval or disapproval as she judged the performance. There was no sound. I was so young and saw the painting do this so often that I thought nothing of it and accepted the idea that some paintings out there can move on their own. Decades later, I remembered the painting and noticed I hadn't seen it in a long time. I asked my now very old grandmother about it. She told me that she had wrapped it in cloth and locked it in her closet. I jokingly told her that as a child I thought I saw the painting move at night. She went dead serious on me and said, Me too, dear. Why do you think I don't put it up anymore? Thanks for telling me you saw it. I thought I was crazy all these years. This happened a few months ago. I'm a 23 year old female and I finally bought a car for myself. I love driving around and listening to music alone or with my siblings. This very night it was around 7 p.m., winter time, and I took my two siblings, 18 year old female and 13 year old male, out for a drive after their consistent pleading because they were bored. Now I'm a smoker, and coming from a South Asian household, women aren't meant to smoke, so I took the opportunity to smoke without worrying that my parents could catch me. The city I live in has a good side and a bad side, and I lived in the very good side, or so I thought. A quiet, suburban area. I didn't hesitate to park somewhere, get out and smoke for a while while leaning against my car, as I don't like smoking in my own car, and scrolling away on my phone. I parked underneath a lamppost, and got out and lit my cig, and all was well. It was dark, but I wasn't scared as I visited that road regularly, and it wasn't too far from my aunt's house. As I lit up, I looked up from my phone and looked around to see a man walk out of the shadows from a bush. I didn't think anything of it. I see people going for walks all the time around here. He was at least 6'4", was on the opposite sidewalk, and I assumed he was just going to carry on walking, so I carried on looking at my phone until I look up to see him just standing there fully facing me and watching me. My sister in the car must have been watching him too and knocked on the window, telling me to come in. I had already butted out my cigarette and was making my way to my car door, keys in hand, and the guy was still standing there completely still. I got in anyway, locked my door and breathed a sigh of relief, thinking perhaps I was just overreacting. I put my key in the ignition and I turned to see where the guy was and I see that he's now behind my car, taking pictures of my car and my registration number. I rolled my window down the tiniest bit and I could see his face a little clearer. He was of Indian descent with a beard and hoodie over his head, showing some features on his face. I asked politely what he was doing and he came towards my window but stood a bit of a gap away. In the most aggressive tone, he said, do you know who I am? No, I didn't know whether it was rhetorical or not. 
I have a lot of stuff going on in my house and I don't need you here parking here watching me. You look real suspicious randomly parking here with your friends. Get the hell out of there. What the hell do you think you're doing? I nervously chuckled to myself, trying to keep calm, but my anxiety was already halfway through the roof at this point. I didn't understand how I looked in any way threatening, as I'm a small girl who's been told I look like a kid. I was in my pajamas and clearly minding my own business. Look, I just parked here to smoke. I come here all the time and live nearby. He got right up to my window, slid his fingers through the gap, and forced my window all the way down, screaming at the top of his lungs for me to get the hell out of here. I screamed in terror, and told him to stop swearing as I had a minor in the car, and he was scaring him. I don't know why, I knew he wouldn't exactly care. He screamed, and went red, If you don't get out of here now, I'll damage you in your car. My adrenaline was already hitting peak. So... I was terrified, didn't even bother putting my seatbelt on, and jolted out of there in a panic. I went straight ahead at a junction leading me to a dead end, but I took that opportunity to just calm down. My whole body was shaking with adrenaline. I couldn't even keep my foot on the clutch. My sister was quickly asking me if I was okay before I could even answer. I see a pair of headlights zooming towards me. It was the guy going at least 50 miles an hour on a 20 miles per hour road. He nearly crashed into my car, but by some miracle he didn't. He jumped out the car, and this is when I realized my window was still all the way down from when he forced it down. I wanted to cry, and I quickly tried to shut my window, but he was too fast. He half threw his body into my car, through my window, and I screamed so loudly with his ear right next to my face, I'm sure I deafened him. He was trying to steal my car keys from the ignition. I thanked my lucky stars that with my car, in order to get the car keys out, I would have had to have had my foot on the clutch, which I didn't. With one hand, I was pressing down on the horn of my car to make as much noise as possible to alert the people in their houses, and with the other, scratched his hands away from my car keys, and my poor siblings were in the car, bawling their eyes out. My little brother had no idea what he could do to protect me, and my sister was in the passenger seat experiencing all of this in front of her eyes. I heard the guy enough for him to get out of my damn car. I told you to get out of here or I'll hurt you. I told you. The guy attempted to pull up my door handle trying to open it and get in, and then I noped out of there. I didn't care that my body was half shaking like a fish out of water. My main priority was now the safety of my siblings and myself. I knew that we were making a loud commotion. I held onto the horn of my car, trying to get the attention from other houses, but nobody helped. It was 7 p.m., and I was certain that people would hear me screaming, but they all acted oblivious. I managed to wriggle my way out of that dead end and went to a new street, and to a totally different area and parked. I knew this probably wasn't a good idea, but I knew the guy wasn't following me, as I drove around for a good 10 minutes. I just released my emotions and me and my sister and little brother were just sitting there in the car sobbing away. This was the first time that anything like that had ever happened to me. Or any of us. I rang the police and immediately wanted to punch myself in the face when the dispatcher asked if I got his registration. Of course, in my panic, I didn't. I wanted to slap myself in the face because I listened to these horror stories on YouTube all the time and always felt they taught me how to handle certain situations and I couldn't even bloody get a registration number. The dispatcher was amazingly empathetic, as was the female officer who called me the next day. As a woman, she understood how scary that must have been for me and again, I cried to her. Unfortunately, the cops informed me there were no CCTV cameras where it happened, so they couldn't really do much, especially with me not knowing where he came from, if he came from a house, and if so, which one, or his registration number. The female officer apologized to me, but it really was my fault for not mentally noting important information. They made a report of my attack, so if anything similar happened in the area, they can connect them. The officer said I most likely parked there and he was doing something illegal and freaked out on me. I just think he was a freak who enjoyed scaring people, who looked like easy prey. So to the creep who tried to steal my car, let's not meet again.
This takes place at an anime convention, and it creeped my friends out pretty bad. I ran a panel and just decided to call it a night at 8pm. I was exhausted, talking to my fiance as we came in. Ended up not going to sleep until around midnight. There was a pop machine on our floor, and we were sharing a hotel room with two other male friends and one other girl called Jenny. At around 11, Jenny comes back from the convention rave. She asks if I want a soda, which we went down to the machine. I usually don't carry cash, but this night I did. I put in the 175 to get my bottle and suddenly see Jenny pale. Let's go back to the room. She's pale, grabs my hand and nearly drops the soda. I look around and notice a guy walking up. He asks if we are attending the con and I'm like, damn, I left my badge in the hotel room. He looks at me and then Jenny. Yes? I'm glaring at the guy. He's pale. He had a con t-shirt on and said he was doing security checks. Now I'm concerned because security checks only happen on the con floor, not the hotel halls or rooms. I suddenly realize he doesn't have a con badge that says security. He doesn't have a walkie talkie either. And finally, Jenny sees me get some courage and I demand to see the security director. By now I'm basically yelling at my fiance roused from the room. The guy backs up and notices some people coming down the hallway from the elevators from the rave. He takes off in a dead run towards the stairs and Jenny was thanking me for saying what I did. I didn't get to hear her whole story until we were up in the room and the real convention security showed up. Yeah, that guy didn't know I was friends with the convention directors and with security. Apparently the guy was Jenny's stalker. He liked her cosplay from a series called dot hack slash slash sign to the point of obsession. Jenny also did not tell her boyfriend or friends about it, thinking she can handle it by herself. I don't want to think what might have happened if I wasn't there. Some people really do get too carried away. We're only dressing up, people. I'm a 37-year-old female, and this happened when I was about 11. I lived in a small brick house with my mum and younger brother. There were two bedrooms at one end of the house, which were mine and my brother's, with my mum's room being on the opposite end of the house. In my bedroom, I had a bunk bed, and I always slept on the top bunk. I had a ceiling fan slash light fixture, which had the metal pull cords, and I had tied a string from the one that turns the light on and off, and attached that string to the top bunk, so that I could turn my light on and off once I'd climbed up to go to bed. So one night I'd stayed up later than I was supposed to because I had called in a song request to a radio station and had been waiting on them to play the song so I could record it onto a cassette tape. Yes, I'm that old. They had finally played it and I successfully recorded it. So I climbed out of bed, got comfortable and then grabbed my string, pulled it, turning off the light. About five seconds after turning it off, my room was filled with a blue light. I opened my eyes for a second and scanned the room. And when I saw where the light was coming from, my blood ran cold. There was a Native American man in full Native American clothing standing in the center of my room with his arms crossed with a bright blue aura. And he was just staring at me. I tried to scream, but didn't seem to be able to move or scream for what felt like an eternity. I was finally able to scream and once I did, I was able to grab my string and turn the light back on. With that, he vanished. I told my mum it was a bad dream because she's definitely a non-believer in anything paranormal. And I slept with the light on that night. The next day, my younger brother asked about what had happened and I told him what I had seen. He proceeds to tell me he'd seen the exact same thing about a week before my experience but he told me not to be scared. He said he believed the man was protecting us. Well, I'm 37 now and had almost forgotten the incident until just recently. I was listening to Uncle Josh's True Scary Story podcast episode 12 and there was a story by an anonymous listener from San Diego who'd seen the exact same man, only his was holding a hatchet. I'm in Tennessee, the opposite side of the country from the anonymous listener. As soon as I heard the story, I began shaking and crying. And now I'm curious. 
Has anyone else seen him? This happened around 2016. Back then, me and my buddies were doing some traveling across Central and South America. While we were doing some long deserted highway, my friend and I start to get really thirsty and look on the GPS to see where the nearest town is. We were dying for a soda. It was really hot and our air conditioning left a lot to be desired. We see the nearest town is about 10 minutes away. As we're approaching, we can't see the road, but my friend points a little single dirt road off shooting from the highway. So we take it. It's very bumpy as we drive off and we get to this tiny rundown town in the middle of nowhere. It has about three shops, I think, all next to each other. But the people look friendly and amicable so I tell him that I'd be right back to leave the aircon running to cool down the vehicle and that I would get the drinks. I go in, get the drinks and pay. I should probably mention at this point, I had just taken out a fat load of bills from the bank account in the last city. And when I open my wallet to pay, the cashier's eyes widen significantly. And by cashier, I mean someone with a piece of paper and a calculator. There was no cash register. I grab my drinks and make my way back to the car, but feel all eyes on me from the four people that were in the shop at the time. I jump back in, talk to my friend before peeling off and having a good long swig of Coke. We're back on the road and after about 15 minutes, five cars pull up behind us, matching our speed. At this point we start freaking out. Who the hell are they and what do they want? For a moment I thought it was police, but check my mirrors, and it clearly isn't. These cars look run down as hell, and our car was relatively new, and I was convinced that if we got faster, we could definitely outrun them. So I started putting my foot on the accelerator, pushing 80, pushing 90, pushing 100, and these guys were matching speed adamantly. I could hear their engines roar, and it was clear that if they went any faster, I'm sure their engine would explode but I carried on pursuing the speed. Just as I was hitting 110, do I see lights up ahead of me, and it's the police. I praise whatever higher power there is up there, slow down and stop right in front of them, and the cars in front of me just pile on, going quicker than before, and the police take no notice. I speak to the female officer and ask her why she didn't stop those cars. And she said, because I'd pulled over first. Gee, thanks. I explained the situation to her, and she wanted to know why I was speeding. I gave her a quizzical look and explained again that I was being chased by five goons in cars. She kind of bats the complaint away and asks what I did wrong. I give her a weird look. And then I think back to the shop, and it all adds up. The people there must have seen the wad of cash and definitely wanted to stop me to take a piece of it. After explaining it to her, she's quite satisfied with the answer I gave and says to be careful around these parts and that desperate people will do desperate things for money. I sort of thank her half-heartedly and make my way, but she warns me not to speed again. Nice. We leave and we weren't bothered by those people again, thankfully, but it did scare the crap out of me. We then stocked up on drinks after that to not have to make any unprecedented pit stops in rural nowhere towns. <laughs>